She's all set. <clears throat> all right, I'm going to call the meeting to order. It's 707. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, and Mr. Walner. And we'll begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, and to my colleagues, I had um, a couple of back and forth with, with our clerk today with regard to the minutes. So I'm going to ask that we just skip over that. And I'm going to ask that we take something out of order because we've had this on our agenda for our multiple meetings now. And we do, I believe, have Pastor Del Turco with us. So we're going to take uh, out of order, begin with the donation from the International Family Church. And uh, we have to vote to accept that. Am I Madam, wrong, Mr. Gilberto? Is <laughs> Madam Chair, no, he's not signed on quite yet. Okay. So I don't know if we want to go to the, the previous agenda item and... I will let you know once he's signed on. Did you have a specific time that? I had asked him to be here for 7.15. Um, so yeah, he, he's just, uh, we're not quite at that hour yet, so. Okay. All right, so we're, so I, I'd ask that we, if we could just pass over the minutes to my colleagues until we can, I can get my changes finalized with our clerk um, because I don't think we finalized them um, today. We had a back and forth on it. And our next, um, Madam, Madam Chair, Pastor Del Turco was, uh, I believe, just joined us. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's move. Let's just hop over to I, agenda item number six. And is Pastor Del Turco muted? If you could unmute him, Mr. Gilberto. Yes, thank you. I'm here. Welcome. We appreciate your joining us. Thank you. And um, if if you, Mr. Gilberto, if you want to take it away and, and we welcome you to the meeting. Thank and you again. Thank you for the donation. <laughs> At another meeting again. Um, Pastor, so to you, Pastor Del Turco, and for those who are, are watching the meeting here this evening, um, you know, the, a, a very generous series of donations have been made to the town um, by the International Family Church, which is located on Concord Street here in North Reading. Um, donations made to multiple municipal departments, as well as to our school department, which I believe accepted those donations, I think in late January. Um, specifically, the International Family Church made, made donations to the police department in the amount of $20,000, to the fire department in the amount of $15,000 to the Council on Aging in the amount of $5,000, and to the Veteran Services Department in the amount of $5,000. All very generous donations um, done very quietly, um, directly to the departments for which we are um, very appreciative and very grateful. Um, unfortunately, uh, when we were initially intending to accept these, we were in the midst of a very um, significant conversation relative to dangerous dogs. And so we were delayed and unable to accept them uh, in a timely fashion this evening. So I really, that evening. So I really appreciate Pastor Del Turco. You're making yourself available again tonight to come here this evening. Well, well, thank you. My, my pleasure. Um, yeah, that was a contentious meeting. You guys, God bless you. I, I like, I'm sitting there listening to all this. And I think I said, I think I need to pray for these people. This is like, this was crazy. And, and what you have to put up with, God bless you. I'm sure that there's a lot of good that takes place, but those tough meetings are, or difficult. I didn't get to hang around to see how it got resolved. So I have an unfinished book here. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's it's our pleasure. You know, we also uh, donated forty thousand dollars to the school department. Um, you know, like I told Michael, we we didn't do this for a photo walk. We didn't do this for attention. You know, last year was just so difficult for all of us. So challenging um, that we ended the year feeling like you know what we need to be who we are. We all, we are open-handed church, meaning we're very, we're genero generosity is one of our core values. And we feel like the best thing to do uh, oftentimes to improve your, improve your world is just to be a seed sower, to be a value added person. And so we try our best to be value added to not only our, our members, um, but to our town. We love our town. We appreciate our town. We've been uh, quiet and, and has just served quietly. Uh, we, of course, would love to be more involved than we want to be, but that, that was the only message to say, 
Thank you, town, for all that you're doing. Thank you for going through the worst time in memory. Um, and, and we wanted the, the places that serve people the most that do such a great job and are not thanked as often as they should be to say, we're with you, we're behind you. Um, we were able to do this and we did it not only for the town, but we also said, we're sending a clear message that uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not leaving 2020 quietly. We're gonna enter 2021 with high expectations and better days ahead. So that was kind of our motive. And uh, so thank you for receiving it. Thank you for uh, being so gracious to allow me this moment. And uh, uh, we look forward to do more for our town. Well, thanks. The thanks go to you and to your church and to the members of your church, Pastor. And I won't speak for my colleagues, but I will say we can use the prayers every week, every meeting. <laughs> but I'd like to give my colleagues an opportunity to just acknowledge you and your church and your membership for the very generous donation. So, um, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, again, just, you know, behalf of uh, the community and myself personally, you know, I, th I think your, uh, your assistance was well targeted, certainly, you know, our first responders, uh, uh, we've had a substantial amount of um, added expenses and things associated with the dealing with the pandemic, the school department, um, Council on Aging again with their outreach towards our, our most vulnerable citizens. Um, all that you've donated here are going to go to, uh, to assist us and and meeting the needs of the, the neediest people in our community. And greatly appreciated. And um, you're a good member of the community and uh, we're glad you're here. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, our pleasure. Thank you. Mr. Studo, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, we appreciate it, especially in this time. I mean, anything, anything helps where, you know, we, we're always looking for resources and we've been waiting for the shoe to drop on town finances uh, just because of everything going on. So it's just, uh, it's very much appreciated. And I think it's a very kind gesture in a time where, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Mr. Del Turco could have found a lot of other ways to also spend this money. So it's very appreciated. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez. I, I really just, I'm astounded and um, I, I think you're a shining light in the darkness. So um, being a, a real example of Christianity and, and really can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. The Walner. Yeah, just that, um, this generosity from my point of view, I've been on the board for two years is unusual <laughs> to say the least. And so it's a welcome surprise. And I can assure you that the people that will be receiving this money, the department heads of the people that will be receiving this money will be putting it to very good use. These things are taken very seriously and it won't be, uh, it won't be just kind of blended in. It'll, there'll be some purpose for this money. No, it'll, it'll be put to great use. So you hope, we hope that you'll be proud of it. Thank yes, I, I believe that. Just, and just again, on behalf of the board and the community pastor, just to thank you and to ask you to take that back to your members and just to thank them for their generosity to the town. And we do have to vote to accept this, believe it or not. So do we have a motion, Mr. Studo, and you're on mute. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to accept gifts from International Family Church as follows, 20,000 for the North Reading Police Department, 15,000 for the North Reading Fire Department, 5,000 for the North Reading Council on Aging, Elder Services Department, 5,000 for the North Reading Veteran Services Department. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. We thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for joining us. <laughs> if we can stay, we can continue to use your prayers too. Thank you. <laughs> Amen to that. Yes. <laughs> uh, you definitely have those. I promise that. And, uh, and if we can ever be any assistance, some kind of project comes up, some kind of something happens. Uh, we love getting involved in projects. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and uh, thank you for all that you do for helping so many, having such great patience and, uh, 
uh, we appreciate it very much, and, and uh, it's great to be in partnership together. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to our next order of business. We have on the docket the matter of 20 Elm Street, Chapter 40B. And the members in your packet, there's a letter which I um, <coughs> like to just read into the record. We have a lot of attendees on the um, letter is a letter directed from New York Ventures, LLC, to Michael Gilberto, who's our town administrator. Dear Mr. Gilberto. I am writing in regards to our recent conversations about 20 Elm Street in the hopes of breaking the impasse over the future of this site. With the litigation now entering its second year, my attorneys have advised me that there is no end in sight and legal fees are only expected to continue to rise on both sides. Especially in, try in trying financial times like these, I believe it is incumbent upon us to try to find common ground on a development on the site that promotes the needs and interests of the town, while also making financial sense for me and my family as we look towards the future so that both sides can put a stop to the mounting legal fees. As you know, my most recent settlement offer was for a 132 unit 55 plus condominium project under chapter 40B. My attorneys have informed me that the town council's response to that was 100 total units maximum. I appreciate that offer and have looked into its feasibility. Unfortunately, due to high and rising infrastructure costs, it simply doesn't pencil out financially particularly under Chapter 40B. In the interest of bridging this gap, I would like to propose an alternative. My proposal is for 100 market units plus an additional number of affordable units in a number to be negotiated. Many affordable housing bylaws require 10% affordability, which would mean 10 units for a total of 110 units. This would be more than meeting the town halfway and a reduction of almost 50% compared to the 40B. This project would be all 55 plus condo units and would preserve the restaurant building and pool. In order to meet state septic requirements without crossing the threshold for a treatment plant, the 110 units would need to be developed as two separate projects, as was the case with the 132 unit proposal. With affordability of 10%, this project could not be permitted under Chapter 40B. It would require a rezoning. Although rezonings can sometimes be controversial, I understand that the amendment to the State Zoning Act recently signed into law by Governor Baker now allows rezonings with a simple majority vote in some instances. One potential way to come under this new law would be to rezone the site as a natural resource protection district, which would concentrate development to the upper portion of the site and the area closest to the Ipswich River left permanently undeveloped. I believe I can make a proposal like this work financially, and I think it would bring a lot of benefits to the town while avoiding any school impacts. It would also provide environmental benefits and protect the Ipswich River. And for that reason, I would hope to also get the support of neighbors. These are just the broad strokes of my proposal. If this general concept is something that you think the town can support, my goal would be to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with the town regarding the details of the new zoning and the town's support of the same. If there are additional items of impact mitigation that the town would like to see addressed in an MOU, we would be open to a discussion of that. I really believe there is a compromise to be reached here that works for the town, for me and my family and for the neighbors. You and I are both reasonable men and I hope we can find our way there. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Nicholas A. Yeva, manager. You know, before I turn over for discussion to my colleagues, we do have a, quite a few people here for the meeting this evening. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we remind uh, the members and, and participants and um, attendees to know that, you know, this matter is in litigation and we have been addressing quite a bit in um in privileged discussion. So we wouldn't be by discussing this, we, we, we don't intend to be discussing our litigation strategy or any 
case related information. But I do want to at the outset um, let the members of the community know that, you know, this is active litigation and that taking the issue to Mr. Um, Gilberto in this manner, um, you know, that's one way to do it. But uh, I do also think it, it paints Mr. Gilberto in a light that's unfair and people can take this to social media. And I hope that everyone that's attending and listening recognizes that what people post and publish on social media isn't the facts all the time. And it isn't even the facts most of the time. And that the town is pursuing and has taken a stand in the litigation and is maintaining its stance in the litigation on behalf of the citizens of the town. <clears throat> so um, at first glance, it appears that there's some side or backdoor or side discussions and that isn't the case and that's not accurate. So I just wanna stand forth and tell you that that isn't how our town administrator operates number one. And number two, I think it's unfairly portrays the stance that we have taken. And we are defending the matter and we are in litigation fighting on behalf of what the majority of the residents have told us we need to fight for. So taking it to social media isn't going to get you all of the facts. And I thought it was important for us to put it on the agenda this evening so that my colleagues and I could discuss this and give Mr. Gilberto the opportunity to speak as well if he did. And I also think that Mr. Yeba can take it to the streets. He can meet with the butters. He can go ahead and talk to people about alternative proposals, but it should be done out in the open in the sunshine, not in, the, in a back room conversation or a letter to the town administrator. You want to air out possible alternatives, you have a pile of people waiting to hear from you and you should be taking it out to the street. So these alternative proposals, there's nothing stopping Mr. Yeba from meeting with neighbors, uh, from meeting with the groups that are involved with this matter, sitting down and talking to people about what might, might or might not be palatable to them. And I'll end my comment and Turn, turn it over to my colleagues, but I'd like just Mr. Gilberto to speak to. Go ahead, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I just, a, a comment that I would like to make both for the board members to hear publicly, but also for the, the community to hear, you know, regarding the letter is that, you know, there's a reference to recent conversations between Mr. Yeba and I, which were originated by him during our discussions in December regarding Group One Entertainment's now terminated license to operate the Hillview Function Facility. During the conversations, I advised Mr. Yeba to submit whatever he wished to be considered by the town through his attorney to town council on this matter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. To my colleagues, do you have any uh, question, comment, any input? We're all set. Oh, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, no, I did just, uh, I think it, uh, I guess I understand Mr. Yeba's uh, outreach and attempt to uh, to get us to go to the table with him or something uh, to have some further discussions, which we have never been opposed to doing. But I thought we made it quite clear uh, to Mr. Yeba and his team and his attorneys that any discussion because of the pending litigation and any proposals that he'd be putting forth would be put forth through town council. And uh, this seems to just be a, an, an attempt on his part to, to reach out, but also to circumvent the system which we put in place to make sure that, uh, you know, we protected the town's interest. And, and again, as you pointed out, Madam Chair, there's nothing wrong with having uh, discussions uh, with the developer here um, in public, you know, so people are well aware as to what's being proposed. And uh, as you said, he can take it to the street, he can have neighborhood meetings and he can try and muster some sort of public support if he can. Uh, and if I were him, I would advise him to do that. But, um, you know, as far as responding to the specific proposal, this wasn't the appropriate forum. It wasn't uh, what we had asked him to comply with. And uh, at this point, um, I think he still should go through council. 
And again, as you pointed out, I think it uh, put Mr. Gilberto in an unfair position when the uh, topic of discussion and the reason for the conversation had nothing to do with the 40B proposal and everything to do with the uh, license agreement uh, to operate Hillview. So it was like an, oh, by the way, conversation. It ended up being a, a letter to him painting it out to be something different. So that's all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Any, any, uh, I, Mr. Studo, all set? Yeah. Oh, Mrs. Um, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, I feel that going, going this route and putting words in the TA's mouth is, uh, you know, just another classic example, you know, from, of how not to get it done properly. Um, you know, I, I think, I mean, if you're going to put something in writing, at least be the truth. So I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I think it was very inappropriate in a lot of levels for this letter to be directed at uh, the TA. And then furthermore, at least if you're going to direct a letter to the TA and try to circumvent, you know, board citizen and everyone else in town, uh, you know, by some back way of talking, you you know, at, at least try to be as accurate as possible. So that's, uh, I'll stick to that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Studo. Anything else? Mrs. Gonzalez, all set? Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, I just think it's fair to say that we as a board are united in, in that thought process. Um, and we want to see it done the right way. So, and you know, we have your back, so. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Walner, anything all set? Yeah, I think we're just, you know, I think the board is united. We're satisfied with the, uh, with the approach we're taking and uh, it's still, we're just continuing forward. So, um, Deborah can do what he wants, but we're continuing on our path. Okay. All right. Madam Chair, just to point of, again point out that you know this this was a document that was a correspondence sent to the town administrator. It's public information, public document, and the board thought it was important enough to uh, give it the light of day that it deserves. Definitely, especially because it's talking about alternative proposals to the 40B that that was proposed. That's currently in the you know under a, a in the uh, litigation pattern. So. Um, that it is important for people in the town to because we're we're carrying we're carrying the will and the wishes of the people of the town as as board members here. We don't decide if if you know everything ultimately re results successfully in that litigation for the propon the you know the applicant. It still goes back to our zoning board for permitting, and so it's really where you know, continuing to, um, you know, take the town's position in the litigation and we're, we're fighting that position uh, on behalf of the town. And there still will be, if it doesn't, if that's unsuccessful and it results in a favorable decision for New York Ventures, mm -hmm. there'll still be a public hearing that'll be held by the zoning board at which people can appear. So it it isn't a it isn't a litigation pattern. It's there. It is it doesn't seem like it's going to be resolved anytime soon, but it is important to for uh, members of the town to be aware that you know he's clearly proposing one or two alternatives to that 40B as the letter discloses. So just as a point of information, Madam Chair, you, having been involved in all the other 40B projects that were ever proposed and even built in the town of North Reading, the process that was instituted previously, and again, it's entirely up to the Board of Appeals, was that they had a group of um, town officials and residents in, a, in affected areas and members of the community involved as a team to negotiate with all the other developers to come see if there could be a consensus reached as far as any proposal to bring uh, forward uh, through the Zoning Board of Appeals deliberations. And those were all done in public session, um, posted meetings, uh, so that, you know, I don't see any reason to deviate from having any discussions about alternative uh, without involving public discussion and public meetings. So uh, it's up to the Zoning Board of Appeals how they want to handle it moving forward. But uh, the past practice, and again, I've been, I was involved in every single one of those previous discussions and projects, and it seemed to work out fairly, very well in relation to educating the public, giving them the facts, 
what's on the table and then uh, what any final recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, could be made. So I, I see no need to deviate from that. Great. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Important, important information. All right, so if there's nothing further on the topic, our next order of business is public comment. So if we have anyone that is here for public comment, I think you can either use the raise hand function or also use the chat room. And I do see... There's one hand raised. Mr. Gilbert, uh, There's one hand raised, Ms. McGoldrick has her hand up. Okay, great. So if you could, Ms. McGoldrick, if you could un... Mute. Oh, you are unmuted. Okay. Welcome. If you could state your name and address for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Sarah Allen McGoldrick. I live at 4 John Bickford Way. I'm an active member of the Defend Ipswich River Communities Group that has been fighting against the 20 Elm development for the last two years now. Uh, to me, Mr. Yeba's letter indicates what many of us already know. He is losing the fight at the Housing Appeals Committee and his attorneys are advising him accordingly. This side letter to Mr. Gilberto, while being unfair to it sounds like what the conversation was in fact uh, between the two gentlemen, is yet another bad faith attempt by Mr. Yeba to push this project through under whatever channel possible. Mr. Yeba has repeatedly demonstrated that he is not concerned with straining North Reading's resources both the natural resources of our Ipswich River and our community resources of our public service departments, our schools and our roads. If Mr. Yeba truly cared about this town and wished, wished to put forth an act of good faith, I suggest that he instruct his attorneys to withdraw the subpoenas he has filed, seeking the protected and confidential information of our residents with disabilities living in group homes. I support the select board acting on behalf of the town to dismiss this letter and reject this inappropriate compromise put forth by Mr. Yeva. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I have, I know it says healing woman, but I know it's you, Mrs. Stoltz. I can see your hand raised. <laughs> Hello, you have to unmute yourself too. That's okay. There, we are. there you go. Okay. Welcome. Um, if you could state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Elizabeth Coolidge Stoltz, and our address is to Gillis Drive. And I'm not sure to what extent I'm supposed to say something. My husband has a question. Um, we are the family of the unnamed individual who lives in a group home in North Reading that is under the jurisdiction of the subpoenas issued by NY Ventures LLC, who has retained an attorney because we did not have a choice in the matter because their constitutional rights were entangled in this mess. Because of the issue of privacy, and I do not know any other parents or guardians who are aware of the threat to their loved one, I have not tried to breach the privacy shield and notify anyone else. But there are dozens of other people who stand the same risk of irreparable and possibly permanent harm as my loved one. So while this legal action is being taken by one family, you should know there are dozens of people who are listed as residents on the census in North Reading who have no voice now except what I can provide, but who live here and are real people and who could be permanently harmed by this action, not because the town doesn't have safe harbor, 
but because it has asserted safe harbor and the way Mr. Yeba wishes to get his way is to run over their rights to get at data he doesn't have a legal right to have and no developer has ever gotten before by breaking the state process to get at their information so that he can break the town's status, making safe harbor the minimum that the state asks each town to do for its citizens into a speed bump for him to get what he wants, which would not even permanently add affordable housing to the town, but only temporarily add it while he permanently adds to his personal profit. And so I wanted to speak on behalf of dozens of people, many of whom I know personally literally have no voice. Because if I don't, they're going to be lost in somebody's search to make a lot of money. And they can't be here tonight, but I could. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Stoltz. And just to, just to, not respond, but to add to that, that the, the town's position and the town has asserted and the, the town has asserted in the litigation contesting that in alignment with the position that you bring as an intervener in your motion to intervene. So that the town's position is aligned, but you bring a face to the argument. So it is important. And, and hopefully you will be permitted to intervene because of that. So we are in alignment with that position and uh, you know, contesting the subpoenas that were served. So we, we, do, we do, you know, that is a matter of record. So the town's in alignment with contesting that. And I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Absolutely. And I've read the town documents and not only agreed with them, but got legal opinion that they were actually extremely well written. Um, I just wanted to make it clear that the people at issue here are not abstractions, they're actual people. Sure, and I think it's helpful. You know, we can be in a litigation as a town and not have a face. And I think you bring the face to it, which is really important. So thank you. Um, is there anyone else that would wishes to speak. I don't see any other hands raised, nor do I see chat. Mr. Gilberto, all set? Oh, Madam Chair, um, Ms. Spano has- Oh, I, I'm, I apologize, I'm sorry. I was looking over to the right, I'm sorry. Mrs. Spano, can you please state your name and your address for the record? I apologize. No worries at all. Uh, Andrea Spano. Um, at three Hayward Farms Lane. So first, I just wanted to thank the board because I think, you know, you guys have worked so collaboratively and have done such a great job of keeping the community in the loop. Um, Mr. Gilberto, it's obviously clear that this, you know, that you, you have the community behind you in this situation with this crazy um, letter that you received. So, you know, be assured that we are all, we all understand the situation as it is. Um, and I just wanted to kind of comment on and echo some of the things that Sarah said. One that, you know, as a, one of the leaders of Defend Switch River Communities, um, you know, we've talked a lot about where the line is, where we, what we feel is acceptable, what isn't. And, you know, this is a non-starter. I think you guys all probably, I mean, it's a non-starter especially given that it was directly to Mr. Gilberto with no attorney. Um, it, it just didn't follow any process, but the deal itself is, is a non-starter. You can talk to the community. I don't believe the community would have any, any positive things to say about it. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of good faith, he, Mr. Yebbett does not have any, he's not done anything. In good faith. So for us and for you guys to put forth good faith and, 
have some discussions, it doesn't seem like a likely possibility. I mean, he started playing hardball. He's bullied people. I've seen a butters cry. He misrepresented Mr. Gilberto in his good faith attempt. Like there's really no good faith there. So until we see any good faith, which I don't know if it's possible, I don't think that we have any motivation to sit down and discuss anything. I think we're in it for as long as we need to be in it for. We are, um, you know, very willing and eager to support the town's position. And, um, you know, one thing I think that did happen out of this thing, after all this money has been spent by the town, all this, these hours of all of these people that have come together is that, you know, it really has kind of brought the community together a little bit in that all these different walks of life have come together and have this united vision here of wanting to protect what is ours, what is the town and, and what's right for the town and all of our resources and our people and our, and everything. So I think that we should continue this trajectory and kind of stay the course and just remember that, you know, we've gotten this far together and that if we change course now, it's, you know, if we keep the course, it's gonna, we're gonna see the results we want. So that's all. Thank you, Ms. Stefano. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak for public comment? All right, now let me just look and make sure no one's waving. No, all set? Don't see anybody. Um, okay. Ms. McGoldy and Ms. Spano, thank you for your comments. Yes, appreciate it. All right, so I think we can move on now to uh, 7.30, 7.30 public hearing. We're only 14 minutes late on it. So uh, for the June and October annual town meeting date for 2021. Is there a notice in the packet that should be read? There is, Madam Chair, on page 32. All right. Okay, the Town of North Reading public hearing town meeting dates. The North Reading Select Board would, will hold a virtual public hearing on February 22nd, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. to receive public input on selecting dates for the June and October 2021 town meeting in accordance with North Reading Home Rule Charter 2-4-1. And the hearing notice includes the hearing information as to how to access the hearing via the internet with the Zoom link, telephone, uh, dial by location with the meeting ID. Okay, that is posted and published by the select board. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, oh. So the, can you hear me okay? We should open the, open the public hearing. I guess we've just officially opened the public hearing. Mr. Gil, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm joined this evening by Town Clerk Barbara Stats and um, Parks and Recreation Operations Manager Maureen Stevens. Um, the three of us have been in conversations over the past few weeks, along with the Superintendent of Schools regarding uh, potential uh, options for, um, for, the, for both the June and the October town meetings. And um, at this stage, we are recommending to the select board to, um, to determine that the June town meeting be held on Saturday, June 5th, and that the October town meeting be held on Saturday, October 2nd. And the reason for that is because while we certainly believe we are making progress with regard to the ongoing pandemic, and we are optimistic that we'll be in a situation where we'll be able to see um, some of the restrictions on gatherings lifted, um, that is by no means a certainty, certainly for June, and, but also I think potentially for October as well. And so we felt that the most prudent thing for us to advise the board to do at this point in time was to plan for outdoor town meetings uh, as we have had on now uh, two occasions on the turf field on Saturday mornings, both uh, on June 5th and October 2nd. Um, if the public health conditions determine that we're able to go to the more reliable venue um, indoors, we certainly have the ability to do so. But um, at this point in time, it's unclear that that will be the case. And so 
I think the feeling is the, the earlier in June that we do it, the better, so that we avoid um, the weather being um, too warm. And the earlier in October that we do it, the better we avoid the weather being too cold. So um, I, I think that we're unanimous in that recommendation uh, at this stage. And again, we at this point, the facility is available and can be made available for the meetings. Um, it just would be a, a matter for the board to uh, to take a vote to determine that those would be the dates for the town meeting at this stage. And um, Ms. Stats and Ms. Stevens are here. We're happy to answer any questions if there are any, but I do think at this stage, it's probably pretty straightforward at this point. Okay, do my colleagues have any questions? None. I, I just, were you able to talk to Mr. Murphy? Um, so we invited Mr. Murphy this evening, although I don't see him um, here. Um, so we, we've not communicated directly with him on it. Um, I was uh, hoping he'd be able to join us this evening, but I don't, I don't see him. Okay. Um, I would note that obviously, as you're aware, if there was an issue with that date, you know, we have the ability under the public health emergency declaration to continue the date if need be. Yes, okay. All right, so in that this is a public hearing, is anyone in attendance, does anyone in attendance wish to speak um, regarding this matter? If you could raise your hand. Uh, Madam Chair, I would note too, we put in the board's packet the uh, calendars that the town clerk put together for both June and October to show the holidays. So we, we yes. so there's yeah. no conflict with the charter provision that prohibits a, um, a town meeting being held on a major um, civic okay. or religious holiday. I did, we did see that. Thank you, clerk stats for that. I don't see any hands raised. So, um, if did there's- Did I see a hand go up from um, Mr. Stoltz? No? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So seeing none, I guess we could, do we have a motion? Yes, you do. Madam Chair, in accordance with the Town of North Reading Charter Section 2-4-1, I move to set the dates for the 2021 Town Meeting as follows. Saturday, June 5th, 2021. Saturday, October 2nd, 2021. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. In Manupelli is aye. All right. Thank you to Ms. Stevens aye. and Clerk Stats for joining us too. We know it's going to be a lot of effort to put this together. You did you did amazing jobs and public facilities did amazing jobs setting up our, our other outdoor town meetings. So we really appreciate all the extra effort the school department, everyone put into getting that ready for the town. So I guess, I guess good luck getting these next two ready. Clerk Stats, did you want to add anything? I, I just wanted to echo that comment, Chair, Chairman Emanuel Pelly, that it really is a collaborative effort on everybody's part. You know, it really, really and truly is. So thank you for recognizing that and all the departments that, that do play an integral part in getting this, you know, to happen. There's a lot of planning that's unseen that goes into it. It doesn't just happen that day. So we thank you for putting, thank you to Mrs. Stevens for helping out and getting this squared away for us. All right. We have, uh, you know, a few minutes before the eight o'clock hearing. So should we go to the next item and get the COVID update from Mr. Gilberto? Um, Madam Chair. You want to hold off on that because I think we have a longer discussion, Board of Health discussion awaiting us, right? Yes, Madam Chair. My, my recommendation would be, I see Ms. Luckowitz has joined us and she has revised the service rating policy. I think that should be a short discussion if we wanna to go to that item. Sure. Uh, Amy, are you there? Did I see you just come in? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, just on time. I think uh, yeah, if, you're, okay. if you're up for it, I think we're ready to, to take that item up. Sure. Okay, so we, we did have our first reading, so. It's saying first reading continued. We, we talked about allowing Ms. Lutzkowitz to come back with the modification on that. Right? Yes. All right. Well, welcome. 
Ma and uh, I'm to Madam Chair, through you. Yes. To Amy, Amy, do you have the document that's before the board? I know you gave us comments and we incorporated yes. them, but I'm, 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 I'm on page 48 in the board's packet, folks. You can pull that up. Oh, you mean to share that? You mean Amy, to share you, the you screen? In front of you, though? Um, I'm pulling it up right now. Yeah. Okay. And Madam Chair? Yes. If you don't object, could I um, could I share my screen and perhaps put the uh, revision right up on the screen for everyone to look at? That's what I, I thought that's what you were asking. I'm okay. sorry. Yes. No, I, I, I wasn't, but that's a great idea. <laughs> this one's easy to find. It's the last page in the packet. And so um, I guess, Amy, would you like to go through? Do you want me to go through it? Sure, is this reflecting the one that I sent today? Uh, if you sent one today, I haven't seen it to be candid with you. Oh, it. no, okay. I did send one um, this morning. Okay, and um, then I, I have not seen that. Then do you mind if we switch then and um, I can share my screen? Uh, I don't object, Madam Chair, through you. Of course, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. There we go. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> Shall I begin? Please. Okay. So um, there weren't uh, tons of changes. I did. I was able to incorporate the one suggestions um, you yourself and also um, address Mr. O'Leary's concerns related to allowing. <clears throat> excuse me employees to serve under certain circumstances related to um, being uh, supervised. So uh, you can see the track changes on the right. Um, just again, addressing, you know, you know, in the first paragraph, um, addressing that we need to see the expiration date because I have come across a couple of certifications that were lacking that. Second paragraph highlighted um, uh, that again, um, everybody who was taking orders and serving out uh, serving alcoholic beverages. Uh, we deleted the part that says in a retail setting because this should be um, all settings. So we changed that to just in North Reading. Um, mm -hmm. We'll just move up the paragraph that you see in, in the third paragraph, that large sentence that says uncert uncertified servers and salespeople may. I would just move that up to paragraph two. That was my note today. Sorry, I'm sorry you didn't see that. Okay, no, no I apologize as well. That's okay. Um, and again, addressing the evidence must be retained on hand and it would be acceptable if that was an original copy, printed copy or digital image. And um, that very final sentence at the end was something that I think that we had all agreed on that there would be um, a possibility of a show cause hearing if that was, if that was applicable. So questions, comments to my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's, I think it addresses uh, what needs, what needs to be addressed, which is updated certifications for all employees and that the uh, employer needs to have that information readily available when any of our personnel go in and ask for it. And specifically they have to have it and produce it at the time of the license renewal. And if they don't comply with it, so I don't think it's a, it's a stretch that it's, this is, this is uh, overcomplicated or uh, difficult to, uh, to maintain the, the records uh, for the police department or Amy or anybody else. Uh, so I, I think it's good. Great. Thank you, Mr. Valeria. It actually makes my, it actually makes it easier for me. Right. And it should be. And again, when they re come in for renewal, they should be able to produce uh, their roster of employees who serve alcohol and make sure that they're certified and certified to us that they are. There's nothing wrong with that. Thank you. That's great. Any other comment? I just have one, one recommended addition just to keep in the format in your third paragraph down. And this is just my English major rearing its ugly head here <laughs> in the in every other paragraph, you have an and or, and I think it's important to say only certified staff may take alcohol orders, serve alcohol 
beverages and or sell alcohol beverages just to keep it consistent with really the whole purpose of adding that provision in for us. Okay, I think that makes a lot of sense. Mr. Gabriel, I'll make that note here and I'll send it to you again. Great, and we can present it with that revision for the second reading, Madam Chair, if that's okay. Sure. That's all right with my colleagues. Um, it seems like everybody is, there's really no, no other issue with this. Thank you for uh, preparing it, preparing it and incorporating the modifications we talked about last meeting. Anything else? Are we all set with this? Good? Well done. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for making the changes and we'll... Yes. We get to see you at another meeting, probably. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I'll be there. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lutzkowitz. And Madam Chair, there is a motion, I believe, for the first reading uh, approval and waiving of the reading of the entire policy. Mr. Studer, right. you have that? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve. The first reading of the amended policy 1.21, alcohol licenses, server training programs, and to waive the reading of the entire policy. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. M Mrs. Gonzalez. Oh. Is, oh, Matt, I, yeah, yeah she, I, we can't hear her. Ms. Gonzalez, we can't hear you. Hi. There you there are. We go. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Walner. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. All right. Motion carries. Okay, so we'll see that again in its final format for the second reading, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand your, um, if I may, you're recognizing uh, Pam Vath today. I just want to say thank you uh, to her. She was a very um, active member of our coalition. So thank you, Pam. I saw your name on there. I'm not sure if she's there, but I want to make sure your knows that she was part of that. Thank you. All right. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. I'm kind of jumping around the agenda. So. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're on target to start the public hearing at eight. PM on Young Wan Brothers Incorporated doing business as Ginger Gourmet, a transfer of the common victuallers all alcohol license. And um, I think we have all parties here or all parties present. Well, I, I don't know whether you can hear me, but uh, I'm an attorney wager. Yeah. And I believe I'm representing the applicant, correct? Yeah. That is correct. And All I right. believe my two clients are also present. Mr. But Mr. Gilberto, do we have to, oh, do we need to, oh, I don't think I closed the hearing. Speaking of which, do we open that public hearing on, I don't think I closed the hearing on a town meeting, so. I think we'll, we'll adjust the record to reflect that, Madam Chair. <laughs> and there is a hearing notice on page 35 of the packet for it. Okay, great. All right, so. Okay, this is the Town of North Reading Select Board Notice of Public Hearing in accordance with Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws. A virtual public hearing will be held by the Select Board on Monday, February 22nd, 2021 at 8 p.m. on the application of Young Wan Brothers Incorporated doing business as Ginger Gourmet for the transfer of the common victual as all alcohol license from J.R. Crystal Incorporated doing business as Ginger Gourmet to be exercised at 265 to 277 Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts in a one-story mall structure unit of 4,020 square feet with dining areas, cocktail and sushi bars in the front and kitchen rear. The hearing notice that's been published contains the uh, hearing um, access via internet, the Zoom link, the telephone, the mobile, the meeting ID and the passcode by the select board, published by the select board. So we'll open that public hearing and we will invite the applicant to come forward by the attorney. If you could introduce yourself, your name and address and it, who you have here uh, with regard to this application, please. 
Sure. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and the Board. My name is Weija, W-E-I, first name, last name, J-I-A. And my office is in Boston. That is 145 Tremont Street, Boston. And uh, tonight from the screen, I can see Jerry is with me. Jerry is right there. And he is, uh, he is uh, one of the partners of, uh, of this uh, uh, venture. And he is the uh, uh, proposed manager for liquor license purposes. And the other partner, Yongqing, I don't, I don't see him there, sir. But yeah, uh, that's okay. I think, I think he, he's online, but. Oh, okay. Oh, that's I, okay. He's in the waiting room. I'm gonna admit, there's two folks in the waiting room. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but in any event, uh, uh, the. Uh, Young Young Brothers uh, has organized and incorporated just for this purpose to take over the business assets of uh, J.R. Crystal Inc. And uh, they are basically going to do the uh, same uh, restaurant service, same cuisine, uh, Chinese plus uh, uh, Japanese sushi cuisine. So they do not plan to do any renovation or any addition or any, any repair for that matter if, if everything is, it goes all right. So um, we are waiting for, for, for the, I'm waiting for my client to get ready the, uh, the um, uh, uh, necessary documents to submit that to the Board of the House uh, for food service, uh, for fo uh, food establishment permit. Now we have already uh, contacted the landlord and uh, this is, lease is gonna be uh, extended to uh, 2033. 20, a five year plus five year option. And uh, um, uh, the package also contains um, all the financial documents that to, to establish for ABCC purposes, uh, the, the source of their funds. And uh, I, I do not believe the, uh, the submitted, the lease assignment contains the uh, landlord signature because we didn't have that at the time with the submission. But the way I do have it now, I can provide to the board later on after the meeting with the landlord's uh, uh, signature. Uh, this is a, a Mr. Mr. Uh, Jerry, Mr. Wang, uh, has been in the restaurant business for uh, over, I think over 20 years or close to 20 years. They have, the family owns a restaurant in Acton, Massachusetts, and also a restaurant in New Hampshire. And uh, Jerry is gonna be uh, move his, uh, you know, to focus uh, his, uh, his time uh, is North Reading uh, venture once it is uh, it is uh, ready to to open. Now I see I see Yongqin, the other partner, he is in now, and uh, Yongqin is also a restaurant owner. Now right now he's in uh, Virginia, but he's moving over when we have this uh, uh, transaction closed, and he's going to move over here to Massachusetts, and to to operate the restaurant along with uh, with the Jerry as the manager. The Yongqing, as I said, also operates and owns a restaurant in Virginia. He's going to sell it, as, as I, I understand it. And uh, we, uh, uh, the package also contains the, uh, the common business license application uh, along with the ABCC application. And I believe Jerry already and the Yongqing already are done with, uh, with the police department's requirement to do all the fingerprints, uh, I think last month. Or sometime this month. That's a probably is, is, is a, the, the nutshell of what, what they are going to do here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, to my colleagues, do any of my colleagues have any questions with regard to the application? See, I see none. I, I, I saw one hand. <laughs> That's Mr. Gilberto. Okay. <laughs> Um, Madam Chair, through you, just a couple of questions for the, the applicant. Um, th this uh, transaction is proposed to be financed partially by funds um, in bank accounts and also through a personal loan. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, the most, uh, a large chunk of the funds is from uh, uh, Jerry's restaurant in New Hampshire, the family restaurant. Yes, that's considered a personal loan. Yes. Okay. And um, when I looked at the... Um, the application for manager, um, it appeared that um, Yuan, Yuan Fang, I believe is how you pronounce his name, um, that this would be his first 
experience as a manager. Right now, he's an assistant manager at Saki House. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So you propose to be a partner and the manager? Yes. Okay. And, and he's are... going to be the one, he's going to be the one in the premises. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Does, do any of my colleagues have any questions? Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, no, I was just, again, looking just to follow up on assurances that, uh, that uh, Jerry would be, you know, on the premises uh, primarily most of the time, or I don't know how many hours he's looking to devote to it, uh, so that if he's going to be the license holder, you know, we, we need some assurance that he's going to be there. And yeah, then, yes. Uh, the license holder, I suppose, is going to be the corporation, but yes, he's going to be the manager. <laughs> and one, if... if Anytime he's not there, uh, uh, Yong Chen, the other partner, is going to be assistant manager uh, to be in on the premises. Okay, and then as far as you know, the, all the tips training and all that is uh, going to take place prior to uh, the transfer. Jerry already and I'm sorry, Jerry already and serve safe, and the Yong Chen is getting it. And as far as employees that are there now, are they going to be retained, or are you going to bring in new employees who also have to be trained? Yes, I'm not sure about the employee side. Of, uh, I believe they're gonna you're gonna hire, they're gonna keep some and then hire some. But yes, that's that's very important to, to get them trained and uh, tip certified. We we just passed a <laughs> we did a revised policy on uh, on tips training and and having the certifications in place uh, prior to uh, license of transfer. So just be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, I just want to make a comment that uh, I'm heartened to hear that you're you're looking to do a uh, a five-year extension on the lease, and you're planning on being there for a long period of time. I hope you're you're very successful. Again, uh, the current owners will now be the previous owners. Uh, have done a marvelous job, and I'm happy to see that they're surviving here. And I hope you yeah very yeah. hope you're very successful with the challenges that have been faced, and you will continue to face in the next few months. So uh, <laughs> that's no, for I, sure. <laughs> I appreciate your 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 commitment to doing so, and. Um, it appears as though you have the financial wherewithal to sustain yourselves through this and wish you nothing but success. And by the way, the scallops are amazing. Are just that they're amazing. And this is <laughs> a bad time. All right. Thank you. I just had a couple of questions. If none of my other colleagues have any questions and then we'll open it up to public uh, comment. Um, you said Saki house is where Jerry works right now. Jerry, you uh, want yes. to that? Yes. Jerry, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Juan. So I, I don't want to, I want to be formal, not call you Jerry, even though I appreciate yes. you letting us. But so Mr. Juan, what is your job at Saki House? Uh, everything. Uh, as I can make sushi, I can do the bartenders, I can pick out the phones. So it's sometimes cooking. So you, you do have experience serving alcohol. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And I think your attorney mentioned Acton was another family owned restaurant. Do you yes. have another restaurant in Acton? It's, uh, it's my brother-in-law uh, running the restaurant in Garner. Oh, Garden, I'm sorry. <laughs> Garden. That, that's not a place that you worked at, right? Yeah, yeah. I work there sometimes, not all the time. Oh, okay. What do you yeah. do there? So when they need me, I will go there just uh, helping package the food or sometimes if they show hand. So I just, just go over. So in order to be the manager for this establishment here in North Reading, are you leaving your employment with those two uh Mm, because my in Saki house is I running for 10 years. I have my brother in here. I have my uh, uh, my brother's wife, so my uncles. So I, I have plenty of times. If I, I got to the new restaurant, I can go there. So is I can make time. So if I uh, go in the more spreading. Um, I think Mr. O'Leary asked this, but how, how many hours are you, or something like this, but how many hours are you planning to devote to the North Reading establishment where you're going to be serving as the manager? 
Yep, probably uh, this. I don't know how many days, like uh, three, four days, four days. Okay. Um, and I think you said Mr. Chu is going to move from yes. Virginia to, or your attorney said that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yes, yes. Do you, Mr. Chu, do you have experience in alcohol sales, service and sales of alcohol? You're muted. In the, in the, uh, yeah. no, you're oh, yes. I got like um, almost 10 years experience to um, serving the um, alcohol on the bar. So right now I'm running this restaurant with my partner and uh, I work almost like um, 60 to um, 80 hours a week in the restaurant. So I believe I can handle the alcohol service. So are you leaving the restaurant that you are working at to come and relocate to North Reading? Yes. Okay. Uh, my family all gonna move to the North Reading. Oh, wow, well, that's great. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, now we'll open it up to anybody who is joining us. And Mr. Chu, can you mute yourself again? This is a loud echo. <laughs> Is there anybody in attendance that wishes to speak in favor or in opposition to this application? If you could raise your hand so that we could re recognize you to speak. I see none. So do you see any, Mr. Gilberto? I see none and I see none in the chat room. I see none. So we'll close that portion of the hearing. And if there's any, no further discussion, do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve a transfer of the common vehicular all alcohol license from JR Crystal Inc. DBA Ginger Gourmet to Young Yon Brothers Inc. DBA Ginger Gourmet 265-277 Main Street. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. So. Thank you. Nothing but success. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, now we're going to move backwards in, in the uh, agenda to the COVID-19 update and vaccination update from the Board of Health. And we also have joining us, we should welcome and recognize Senator Tarr. Senator Bruce Tarr is joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, I believe Representative been, Jones is also. I, I saw his name anyway. I got new glasses. So I don't know why they're not working for me. I don't know, I don't see that. I'm here, Madam Chair. There, there you are. And we also want to acknowledge and thank you, Representative Brad Jones is joining us as well. So important to have our legislative delegation with us when we talk about this these topics. So we'll let you kick it off, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so I would like to ask uh, the chair of the Board of Health who's here, Mr. Hunt, if he could just introduce the Board of Health and Public Health team. Great. Sure. Um, I want to thank the <clears throat> Board of Selectmen for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. This is a very rare event that it's a Board of Health meeting within a Board of Selectmen meeting. It does not happen that often. I've been on the board for 35 years, believe it or not, and that has not happened before. Um, we want to talk to you tonight about the COVID-19 crusade that we have been waging since March of 2020, which is a year ago. It began with our first case, who was a Biogen employee and a town resident that brought COVID-19 to our attention. So I'd like to introduce you to our board and our health department. There are seven of us. Um, we're a fairly substantive group, uh, larger than I've ever seen in the town before a mixture of volunteers and town employees, 
First, the Board of Health. I'm, I'm Gary Hunt. I'm the chairman of the Board of Health. There's Pamela Vath, who is on the board and has been on. How many years, Pam, have you been on the board? Pam, you're on mute. You're on mute, Pamela. I was just trying to count it up. It's either 22 or 23. Okay. We, we also have many, many years of service from folks such as Pam and myself and Karen Martin. Karen, are you there? I am. And Karen joined us a few years ago. So, um, and then there's the health department, which is what you see most every day when you come into town hall. And that is our, our health agent, Mr. Bracy, if he's on, Bob. Bob, are you on? Yeah, yes, on. Gary, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, our administrator for the department, basically the heart and soul of our department, uh, Stephanie Connolly. Stephanie, are you, are you on? I'm here, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, Stephanie. And also our new, our new acquisition, new hire, uh, Donna Covey, are you, are you on, Donna? Yes, I am, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'd like to uh, acknowledge her. She's replacing Pamela, who served as our health nurse for a number of years, uh, most notably the last year through this uh, COVID crusade, I should call it. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge Pamela for all her service to the town. She did several stints as the public health nurse um, and uh, some, most of them voluntarily, but we, we had to coerce her at times uh, because there were no, no other alternatives. And I just want everyone to be aware of Pamela's commitment uh, to the town. And last but not least, we have Mary Samos. I don't, Mary, are you on? Mm, I don't believe so. Yeah, Mary I'm is- seeing, I'm not seeing Mary now. Mary is, a, she was is an, agent, an agent to, to the, um, uh, yes, and there's, and then there's several other folks I'd like to acknowledge that are important part of this. Mr. Michael Murphy, who's the head of our, you know, the health and safety within the town, is responsible for uh, oversight of uh, the health department. Our town administrator, Mike Alberto, who's been very active and very cooperative, working with us all the time, but most notably in the past year, and and. God love him, Mr. O'Leary, who's the liaison to the Board of Selectmen, and I trust he keeps you all well informed on what we're doing on a, on a day to day basis. He's been very, uh, very involved in all of our meetings uh, in the past year or more. So I'd like to acknowledge that contribution as well. Uh, I don't know, Pamela and Bob, do you want to just spend a minute to give a quick update on COVID, where we were, uh, where we are, how many cases we had, where we stand before we get into the, uh, the emergency preparedness and COVID um, clinics that we've run? Pam or Bob? Uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to Madam Chair, I would defer the numbers to uh, Mrs. Vath, and then I'd be more than happy to speak on the clinics that... Um, up to this day. Okay, thank you. Pamela? Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chairman, to tell you the numbers. Um, right now, we have a total of 1,026 patients who have been notified, we've been notified as having positive or suspected probable um, infections with COVID-19. We have this week, we have had 18 new patients, and that is significantly different than what we've been averaging on a weekly basis. Uh, we are currently monitoring 69 cases. We have 941 cases who have re recovered. Just as a little reference point, a weekly census this week was 18, and over the last few weeks, it varied between 43, 47, 66, 68, 53, 31, 66, 74. So it's been all over the place. Um, right after, a week after Christmas, we had an average of 13 patients a day, and then it dropped to eight patients a day. And then two weeks after Christmas, 
we had an average of 17 patients a day, which gave us a, that blip uh, uh, that, we, that the state and we anticipated would happen after the gatherings for the holidays. Um, it's been very busy and we've been fortunate enough to have the help of a lot of the folks in town hall who have given up some of their time and their <clears throat> hours to help us do contact tracing and notifying patients. So they need to be thanked very much for the work that they've done. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, we've also had a lot of support from the school department and Dr. Patrick Daly and the school nurses yes. have been assisting us. It's been a major effort, not only of us, but also volunteers and other town employees. Uh, it's a lot of it you're aware of, a lot of it happens behind the scenes, but it, it's been a, a battle. It's been mm -hmm. a battle. Robert, do you want to give us a little update on your perspective on COVID, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, through you to Madam Chair and, and the members of the select board and our, our state delegation who's here this evening, thank you for the opportunity um, to give a brief overview of what we've done up until this point. Um, just so everyone's aware, uh, the health department has met frequently uh, since March um, to be updated on the COVID-19 vaccine and, and updates from the Department of Public Health. Also, it's, it's noted that, that as a community, uh, we have worked tremendously uh, well and, and met weekly with the town administrator, the director of public safety, uh, the fire chief, uh, the public health nurses, um, and the superintendent of schools, just to kind of keep ourselves abreast of, of current uh, information as it has come down through uh, weekly uh, calls that I have taken part in uh, twice a week with the Department of Public Health since March. Um, you know, through the Board of Health, we have implemented several orders over the last year or so um, to try to uh, minimize or uh, the spread of the virus within the community, uh, working with the schools and, and working with the local nursing home and working with our delegation. Uh, up until this point uh, on the vaccination clinics, we have conducted 12 vaccination clinics uh, for first responders um, to 75 and over. Uh, last week, the governor had uh, stated that we would move into a, a new priority group of 65 plus uh, plus individuals with two or more comorbidities. Um, so right now we're moving into this week to do uh, two more clinics this week, two more clinics next week before we get into uh, second doses uh, for the folks that we've already administered the first uh, vaccine for. Um, so that's really just a very quick overview of um, the clinics and, and, and what we've done up until this point. Okay, thank, thank you, Bob. Uh, uh, just uh, Gary, if Bob could just uh, highlight and articulate a bit more clearly in relation to the second doses, I mean, we, we had a lot of uncertainty up until Friday, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so j just to, to state publicly again, Bob, as to you know, where we're at as far as those people who received the first dose here. Okay. The yeah, that gonna have, uh, yeah thank you, Madam Chair, through you to Mr. O'Leary. Um, so we've We've had three clinics right now for our, our most vulnerable population, uh, 75 and over, and we've vaccinated uh, approximately 170 uh, residents. Um, up until this point, up until last Friday, we really didn't see uh, receive any confirmation from the Department of Public Health as to whether or not prioritized for second doses would be uh, allocated to the community. Um, we got that confirmation uh, on Friday uh, and moving forward this week, uh, the health department uh, with the assistance of our director of public safety and the town administrator uh, will be putting a support staff together to contact uh, those 170 residents uh, and schedule a second vaccination uh, clinic date and time for them. Uh, moving forward uh, with the next four clinics that we have this week and next week, um, folks will be able to get uh, their COVID-19 vaccination card uh, as they leave the clinic with a date and time um, for their second uh, vaccination, which will take place in March. 
Thank Mr. you. Tracy, are you are those going to be held in North Reading? Uh, Madam vaccine, Chair, vaccine yes, the, yes, they'll be they'll be held at the Hillview Country Club. Okay. Can you give us a sense of how many um, dosages you are receiving every week? So right now, uh, due to the limited uh, availability through the Department of Public Health, we are only receiving 100 doses a week. Um, we have received. Um, 100 doses this week, which would have given us a total um, of about 370 um, doses for the phase two priority group, um, not including the uh, 70 doses that we got for first responders. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, I don't know if I understood that, but I was going to ask you if the People who are need to get their second dose are they taking priority over over the other people so they get their second dose? I, I'm I'm not sure if I understand that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Madam Chair, if I could help out a little bit, Bob, maybe if you could uh, back up to last Wednesday afternoon when you got a memorandum from the State Department of Public Health stating basically that uh, the dosage or first doses are going to cease coming to communities right. such as North Reading, but there's okay. been a commitment to make doses available for the second dose for those people that were already vaccinated and it'll take place at Hillview. So, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, okay. speaking with the chairman, uh, Mr. Hunt, uh, from the Board of Health last Wednesday, I thought it was important for them to be present here this evening to give the board an update as to you know, what's transpired and with our uh, legislative delegates uh, delegation here, you know, uh, Representative Jones and Senator Tarr uh, being fully aware and cognizant as to what's what's going on because they represent more than this community uh, and the challenges uh, that the communities have uh, been facing. I mean, we prepared ourselves, uh, we got the clinic set up, it's operating well and uh, not even operating anywhere near capacity. We just don't have the doses to do it. And now the, um, uh, the state has determined that local clinics such as North Reading will no longer have vaccine available. But for those that already received the first dose, there will be second doses here in North Reading for them. Okay. So Bob, you might want to just back up the next last Wednesday and lay it out. Yeah, so uh, we, we did receive a, a memorandum from the executive office of um, Secretary Sauters that um, second doses will be allocated for uh, residents who already received the first uh, vaccination. Um, and so we, we will be able to um, be able to provide those folks who have previously received the first vaccination and folks who will receive a first vaccination the next uh, two weeks. But moving forward, moving, yeah, but moving forward, um, it appears based on limited uh, vaccine that the state is moving towards oh regional clinics and the local boards of health uh, may not be receiving any additional vaccine um, after we receive the second doses um, from the Department of Public Health. I, I think, Chair, Chair, Chairman Hunt, I think this might be a good time for us to, to um, just let, we have our legislative delegation and I think it might be a good time for us to hear from them, if that's all right with you. Um, just because they're here and I appreciate that the time that they're taking out for us. So if, if we could let them if speak may, to what they I may, know. Matt, God, if yeah. I may, Madam Chair, if I might speak just briefly. Oh, sure, of course. Uh, about the, the evolution of this whole clinic came out of what's called an emergency preparedness program that the town has been a participant in for almost 20 years and one of the objectives of that program was to prepare for a health um, emergency such as this. And I can't think of a greater health emergency in my lifetime or the last hundred years than this pandemic. And we were instructed to participate. We did so willingly, devoted resources for the last 20 years, only to be told recently that they didn't need our services anymore. So as a result, many of the boards of health and the health uh, departments within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts feel betrayed. And it's disgraceful the way that they've been treated 
by the Department of Public Health. And I think that's something we all need to understand that this wasn't something that we took lightly. We made a commitment to be prepared to do this. And I know Mr. Tarr and Mr. Jones know that from the other communities that they represent. And I thank you. Yeah. It's a good point. It's something that you've been getting ready, getting us ready to deal with for a long, long time. We didn't know that it was going to be this, but we were ready, ready for it. So I think if it's okay, uh, with you, I'd, I'd actually just like to, <laughs> to hear from our, we can, if you don't, if you don't mind, please, uh, pro please proceed. I'm fine. Representative Jones and then with Senator Tar. it doesn't matter who starts, <laughs> um, but I think it's you. helpful to, you know, give us, give us a medication on it. We really appreciate your coming here to attend the meeting. No, and we had, we had a, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We had a good dialogue this afternoon. Um, kind of a preliminary meeting to kind of go with, with, with Gary and Bob and uh, others. Uh, and I, I think you guys have touched on, I think one of the important points to address some of the concerns all of us have had is about the second dosing that some of us have immediately got in, in the aftermath of people who went last Thursday uh, and that everything that I've heard and been told, and, and it sounds like exactly what, you know, Bob and the town has been told is that there is a commitment to uh, make sure that a second dose is delivered to the town so that everybody who has received a first dose in North Reading will be able to receive a second dose in North Reading, obviously in our case at the Hillview. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, we're all looking for the absolute guarantee and I feel comfortable to the extent that that's the commitment that's been made. I'd feel a lot happier if, if in some location within North Reading, those doses were present and under Bob's lock and key, if you will. Um, we're not there yet, um, but we did, obviously we got a delivery last Friday, I think for which would be the first doses for, I think, next week's clinics um, and, you know, working to make sure. Uh, again, I think a lot of this is the frustration of um, miscommunication, lack of communication, changing communication um, at all levels, let's say from the federal to the state and certainly the state to the municipalities who are kind of left holding the straw despite doing a lot of work in the very difficult circumstances. Uh, and trying to work to make sure going forward that that's better. Um, understanding that at the base of it all, I think a lot of it is relative to the supply of vaccine uh, to, to the Commonwealth in our case, but obviously to all the states uh, and that that has presented a challenge um, to meet the demand. Uh, the numbers are not quite lined up with the amount of capacity that exists out there to go vaccinate people um, in the various venues that have been created. Um, I think our preference of which would obviously be local particularly with the populations we're dealing with uh, initially, the most vulnerable, the most difficult to reach, uh, maybe the ones who don't want to get out, can't get out, um, maybe not as tech savvy, uh, not as amenable to hopping in their car and saying, I'm going to go drive to Gillette or Fenway, uh, particularly during wintertime, uh, unless maybe there were Super Bowl tickets involved or something like that. Um, but uh, those are challenges and, and we certainly hear it uh, on a daily basis. I'm, I'm, it's actually a daily and a nightly basis, I should say. Um, but I think we, you know, the message we received, uh, we want to continue to take that message that uh, for North Reading, and I think all the towns I represent, and I'm sure the same is true for Senator Tarr, that there is a strong preference to continue on the path that's sort of been delineated over the past 20 years about trying to address this event locally in dealing with people that are familiar faces in terms of the people administering the program uh, and dealing with people that, you know, know in the community and kind of know where they live in those nooks and crannies and how to approach people that may be resistant to coming out or, or, or seeking help uh, or taking help if it's offered. Representative Jones, of the 170, I, I just, I just want to be clear. So of the 170 that were vaccinated and the 100 more that will be vaccinated, they will be, those 270 individuals will be allowed right. to be vaccinated. My, my understanding from what Bob said was that we've done 170 that are awaiting a second dose and that we have another 100 that will be this week, I think between Tuesdays and Thursdays clinic. And then next week, there will be another 100 between Tuesday and Thursdays clinic. Okay. That would create a total of 370. And that the commitment is that we would have second doses to administer to that group of 370 people at the appropriate time, whether it's, the, the, I think we're using Pfizer. So I think it's the three weeks, 21 days um, sequencing between first and second dose. And I, I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong with that, Bob. 
Uh, Representative, yeah, we're using Moderna, so that would be twenty. Oh, Moderna, okay, so yeah. okay. All right, thank you. I apologize. So that that I think that that answers Mrs. Gonzalez's question. She when she said that they would take precedence, I th think she just was asking with the individuals that were allowed to be uh, vaccinated here, they'll be allowed to get their second dosage. Right, and I think with the commitment, the better understanding of a commitment from the state, I think what I understood Bob to say was that going forward. When you get your first dose, you'll get your sort of your your ticket for your second dose, and that the town would circle back to those people who got a first dose but hadn't got a second uh, appointment scheduled to you know reconnect and say, okay, here's here's when you can come in. Okay, good. Okay, um, and then moving forward for the remainder of the residents that want to be vaccinated, they would have to set up an appointment when it's their time slot at one of these regional centers, you don't foresee it coming back into the hands of the local board to be able to administer the vaccines anytime soon? I would, say, I would say I certainly hope that. I only foresee it if we get to a level of supply um, that's far greater than we have right now. Um, you know, I mean, there's some good things on the horizon. Johnson & Johnson has their hearing for their emergency use authorization, I think this Friday, that's a single dose. But again, uh, you know, as I said to people, unfortunately, creating these vaccines isn't isn't an overnight thing. I think the Johnson and Johnson is like sort of a fifty to sixty day cycling through. Um, I think Pfizer and, and Moderna are longer than that, although they're trying to decrease the, the time frame by which you can sort of start a batch and and have it go out the door. Um, that's my understanding. So I think that you'll continue to see the pharmacies have it because they get an allocation separately from what comes to the state. So the, the CVSs um, and the Walgreens, and I think some of the stop and shop retail pharmacies is one, obviously the VA gets a, a distribution as well. Um, and then obviously there's the, the distribution the state gets, uh, and that's gonna be broken, I think going forward into first doses and second doses. Does that do any, any does anyone have any questions? And I know Bruce is here as well, so I'm sure. Yes, you know. I, w I, I, was, I was hoping to recognize you too, Senator Tar, and thank you as well for joining us for this. Everybody's so concerned about it and worried and nervous and upset and aggravated. And, you know, we're hoping that the, the next version of the rollout works a little bit better than, you know, not that, that the people that are handling it locally can't do a good job. We're just kind of surprised that the rugs kind of pulled out from under the. Agreed. Uh, Agreed and understood. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, Senator Tar. So, so first of all, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to share in the conversation tonight. Uh, this is obviously a subject that's important uh, to Representative Jones and me. And we are working every day um, on issues around vaccine. And it's important to be able to hear the concerns of the folks that are on the front lines. And I do want to take a minute to thank uh, the members of the Board of Health and, and the health director for the work that they've been doing. Uh, this has been a long road, even before we got to the subject of vaccination. You know, we've had issues around testing and health protocols and other things. And I just want to say thank you for the work that they've been doing. Um, with regard to the most recent iteration of it, and I think Brad and I understand that we have capacity in Massachusetts to be vaccinating okay. even more people than we are if we could make full use of what's the infrastructure that's built through the emergency management plan at the local level. You know, one of the difficulties is that my understanding is we could be vaccinating somewhere over 300,000 people in a week. And we've been getting enough vaccine uh, to do roughly 130,000. And so we certainly have to make difficult choices. When I say we, I'm using the royal we of state government of allocating a lesser amount of the product to the greater amount of, of outlets that we have for the product. And that's the challenge. And there's also a balance between trying to get to as many people as possible in some concentrated sites to accelerate the development of herd immunity. But on the other side of that balance is trying to make sure that we get to vulnerable populations who may have restricted mobility, um, who may have other health conditions that prevent them from being able to go to a super vaccination site and stand in line, uh, for instance, um, in addition to some of the things that Brad mentioned relative to um, computer capability and, and savvy in that respect. 
So it is a, a balancing act and we understand uh, that the town has tremendous capability. It's been proving it with regard to what's been happening at Hillview. And, you know, I would say that, you know, currently, um, unless we see significantly greater amounts of vaccine coming into the state, um, it's not likely that we're going to see individual communities uh, be able to conduct vaccination programs for first doses in the way that they have. But I would also say that uh, I think it's reasonable to have a conversation about whether a cluster of communities uh, might be able to do something locally that's something smaller than a super site, but bigger than an individual community. And there's been a lot of conversation in our region going on about that. Um, we had good discussion about it this afternoon with many of the people that are on this call to see if we can envision a way to meet uh, essentially the new rules because you know one of the other changes that was announced uh, when the 100 doses per community was re revoked or changed was the fact that if communities could band together and meet certain criteria, they could as a collaborative be able to run what amounts to a local site, but on somewhat of a, a more regional basis. And you know we are committed to pursuing that idea to see if it might be something that's workable um, we understand that the preference is absolutely to do it um, in the community to continue to do it at Hillville, uh, Hillview rather as it has been happening. But if that can't happen, um, we've also had a discussion about could we get four or five neighboring communities together to be able to do something that's a little bit less onerous than having to go to a super site. So there's a lot of conversations going on. And I would say it's a very, very fluid situation. You know, the, the decision uh, to stop providing 100 batch doses, uh, 100 dose batches to communities seem to happen very, very quickly. And we don't know what could happen uh, next week or the week after that. I would say this, I think if we were to see substantial increases of the amount of vaccine, uh, we could make a very strong case to go back to allocations for individual communities. Thank you, Senator. So it seems like it it would behoove us to try to connect with our surrounding some of our surrounding communities to see if they'd be on board with a re, you know a plan to to do a regional site, so to speak. Well, that that discussion is happening, um, and the town administrator has actually been very good at facilitating it, um, a, along with with Gary and Bob. And one of the pieces of homework that uh, Representative Jones and I have is to start a conversation with the Department of Public Health about what the target is that we would have to hit uh, because we don't want to have people spinning their wheels on a project that even if we get to something that we think is workable, uh, can't get certification because that's the ultimate goal <laughs> is to be able to get certified by DPH to receive doses in the name of a regional effort. Right. And Madam Chair, I would only add to that that the, the other piece of that is to achieve the certification level, but have a comfort level that the commitment of vaccine was going to come through so that we're not sort of faced with what you know, I think North Reading and other communities, I think North Reading sort of built a plan out to be able to do far more than 100 a week than it's doing right now, ideally, um, and then we're sort of, you know, stop short with saying, okay, I know you can do X, we're only going to deliver a percentage of X. And now that's changed so that if we pursue this regional and, and make all the commitments and do all the work that's there and sort of meet what the state wants threshold wise, that we're going to be sort of, if you will, guaranteed the vaccine. So we're not faced with make, doing that exercise and in organizing it only to find out that, you know, 4,000 a week is now, you know, 500 a week. Um, and, you know, at that point, it's like, well, wait a second, we, we, we did a lot of work here. Uh, so I think it's sort of making sure the level of communication is better uh, and a comfort level that the commitment that, that might be made is actually capable of being met. All right. Any questions? No, just comments, Madam Chair. I think it's important to uh, for the board to recognize in the community as a whole that uh, North Reading was on the cusp of becoming somewhat of a regional uh, facility with the blessing of the Department of Public Health only to have the, the rug pulled out from underneath them. And Bob, you can maybe... Uh, comment on that. But the other thing is, you know, with to Senator Tar's point, you know, uh, things are rather fluid here and things change rather quickly. Uh, communication needs to be improved. But, you know, when you have pharmacies, you know, 
again, how they're going to how they're going to administer pharmacies are going to administer these things and and observe people and do a, a, a significant amount amount, I have no idea. I mean, I can't imagine people lined up at CVS or, or Walgreens here in Arthritic and doing it safely and doing the numbers that, that we could do in Hillview or anywhere else. But they've also, you know, cut off the hospitals and the doctor's offices and the clinics. So it's um, it, it's a challenge. But and Bob, maybe you want to uh, just elaborate a little bit more for the board's um, edification in the community that, you know, we were on the cusp of, of, of doing more on a regional basis and thought we had the blessing and then kind of fell apart. And once again, at Hillview, it, what Bob has set up and the Board of Health is, you know, you have a facility there that we could probably do, you know, 1,000, 1,200 plus a week. Uh, and they were preparing to, to do that. But uh, Bob, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so thank you, Steve. Um, so Madam Chair, through you to Mr. O'Leary. So we, we did have communications um, with the State Public Health Department. Uh, early in February to set up a uh, regional site at the Hillview um, to do vaccination clinics for North Reading and surrounding communities. Um, we did submit a, a plan um, that was reviewed and approved by DPH um, to be able to vaccinate anywhere uh, up to 1,000 to 1,400 people a week. Um, and then unfortunately due to um, the vaccine shortage, um, that, that plan got kind of probably put on the shelf. Um, and, and so unfortunately we're not able to do that now. But keep in mind that the, the criterion right now is the capability of what, 750 a day, um, which is a pretty high threshold. But again, it, with the local level here, if we were talking about consorting with the five other communities, you know, that's 150 per day in each one of those communities. We could easily meet those thresholds meet the needs. And I think what's what's happened here and what is of greatest concern to all of us is that those who are most vulnerable in our communities have not been met. The needs have not been met yet. We haven't vaccinated all the people who are uncomfortable or unable or to, to leave our community. And those are those are the ones that haven't been taken care of yet. And now the clinic sort of has to stop before those, those needs are met. And they're gonna to have to go to further distances and out of town in order to get it. So it's unfortunate, uh, I would hope that uh, in their ability to be fluid about things, they could allow local communities to at least meet the needs of the most vulnerable in their communities and then pull the plug on us. And again, we had great conversations with uh, Representative Jones and Senator Tyra uh, this afternoon. Um, they took a great amount of time this afternoon to spend with us and listen to us and hear, you know, we could hear our grievances and kick around some ideas. And uh, They've been very supportive and I know that they're gonna be vocal with the administration and trying to assist local communities like ours to continue to meet the needs of the most vulnerable here. I, I would point out, Madam Chair, as a point of clarification, and this is something we discussed a little bit this afternoon, and um, Steve just made reference to it. One of the odd things here is that Walgreens and CVS get their allocations directly from the federal government. So they're not coming through the apparatus of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which adds another complicating factor in terms of understanding where all of the vaccine is going. Yeah, and I can't imagine that they're not gonna have refrigerators full of uh, vaccine when other local communities could be putting them in the arm a lot more quickly and handing out second doses. But, <clears throat> but again, you know, as you say, it's disjointed because they have contracted with the federal government and totally bypassed the states and uh, which creates a little more confusion. There is some work being done to try to improve the accountability of that. Uh, as I understand it right now, when the vaccine is given, then it goes into the state database. But before it's given, there's no, the state isn't aware of how much CVS or Walgreens has. And there's work being done on that for that exact point, because I think it's an important one. Absolutely. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Mr. Studo. Um, just a couple questions. Uh, you know, thank you, Representative uh, Jones and Senator Tarr for being on. Um, and I actually personally experienced one other thing about distribution. Well, not me, but for my dad, who got a call from his heart doctor at MGH that said his appointment has been canceled because they pulled the doses from the hospital, which was, you know, it was, it made absolutely no sense to him. And it was, you know, just so, but I'm getting some clarity here. But my question is, can you just give, besides what I've been able to read, can you give any clarification on the thinking on both, um, you know, on pulling it, especially from hospitals who seem to have been 
their systems were working well. I mean, I know uncles and clients and friends who they got calls from their doctors and it was coming rapid fire. Like, all right, come in next week, come in this. I mean, there was outreach, there were voicemails and it seemed like it was working fine. If you can, if someone can speak to that. And then also just a comment about the Walgreens. I don't know. I, I do believe in maybe there should be a little bit more account, not even accountability, but just tracking because I don't know if anybody's been trying to schedule an appointment for a loved one through Walgreens the last couple of weeks. Well, not the last couple of weeks, but in the last week. But you're able to go all the way and schedule the first dose. And when you get to the second part where it's for the second dose, it says none are available, which kind of doesn't make any sense because there's there's 15 minute slot appointments available every single day for dose one. So it's almost like, you know, is there... Is there any way for the state to step in and at least say, like, I mean, it does it, it just doesn't make any like it doesn't make any sense. That's the comment about Walgreens. But my bigger concern is if there's if there's any clarity you can provide on what the thinking was to strip the distribution from hospitals, because I, I think it's a really hard argument to make that the state has a better distribution system of medicine than hospitals do. So I'm not sure how much clarity more that we can provide. Let me just say, uh, relative to the Walgreens site, uh, there were widely reported issues today uh, relative to problems people are having with that site, uh, which again adds another level of concern because if folks are turning to that alternative and they're encountering difficulty, then that just compounds an already difficult set of problems. With regard to the shift and the reallocation of vaccines, my understanding is the thought was to uh, reallocate the vaccine to larger sites with the sense that they could get to a larger number of people faster and increase the numbers of those vaccinated more quickly uh, than folks that were doing it on a lesser scale. And that was even true with hospitals because they were doing you know, one at a time and, and whatnot, notwithstanding the point that you made about the fact they were trying to do it quickly. So the best explanation I can give you, and I know it's certainly far from perfect, is the thought was by reallocating to larger sites and get to more people faster. And is it a working, is it like a lot of things where if you try something, but what was happening before actually turned out to be just better? Because, you know, this is kind of new. I mean, well, not new, but for this generation, it's new. Is it something where if there's enough data in a week or two where it's like, well, actually Beth Israel and MGH are getting this out faster than these sites. Like, do you think it's something that we could pivot back or is that kind of like the ship sailed? Uh, it, my impression is, and again, um, Representative Jones, you know, might have a different perspective, but my impression is this is something that's being reviewed on a daily basis. Right. And the, you know, the decision that we saw relative to local boards of health happened very quickly. And I think, a different decision could also happen very quickly. I, I was going to say, I agree with that. And, and I think one of the issues that I've heard was that there might be certain healthcare facilities that weren't necessarily as willing to put the data into the system, um, that, that, this, that the hospital decision was sort of a pause in the way it's been being done, that it isn't necessarily sort of a permanent state, uh, because I think there is a lot of merit. Um, I've kind of talked to people who've gone, you know, done it, you know, locally, the regional, the super site. Uh, and gone through their their healthcare provider, um, and I think it's I think the hospitals I hope are are certainly more of a pause than than a permanent state. Um, again, I think a lot of this is fighting about supply, 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 um, and hopefully if Johnson and Johnson comes on board and that's a single shot, I mean a single dose uh, vaccination makes life a lot easier. Um, if the supply is there to, to be able to have people and say, okay, see you once, and now you're in sort of the done pile. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're continually every day adding more people to the dun pile that get, you know, the second dose now. And that's going to rapidly start to go up, I think, uh, over the course of the next few weeks. Um, but I think I agree that it's hopefully more of a pause. I don't think it's set in stone. Um, I would only I would also say that if, if past is prologue, nothing we've experienced um, the past year seems like it's been set in stone, that it, that it potentially changes from week to week, maybe even day to day. Uh, so hopefully, you know, the hospital situation is something that we can see um, at least come back to some sense of being able to provide some level of support. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just because uh, uh, I it's, it's a pertinent conversation because uh, I have a doctor client that actually today described it that it's becoming the Hunger Games. 
to get a vaccine. I mean, so it's like, I, I just, you know, when you have a medical professional putting it like that, even jokingly, it's like, ugh. so, but thank you for your responses. It, it kind of gives me an idea. And one of the things that uh, we're both committed to is, is continuing to articulate your concerns uh, to the folks that are making these decisions, uh, because it is such a, a fluid conversation. I'm sure we're not the only community that's making these complaints. Not sure. at all. Everyone, <laughs> everyone's probably saying the same thing. Um, yeah, 351 come to mind. I mean, maybe it's only, yeah, so 350 others. So, yeah, um, no, not quite that many, but yeah, it's not a unique argument or concern. Um, Madam Chair, I believe Mr. Gonzalez is trying to speak. You may unmute, Mr. Gonzalez. I, I, I think, oh, Kate, are you back? Yeah. You were frozen for I thought you were frozen. All right. <laughs> uh, am I recognized? Yes, of course. Yes. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I want to thank the Board of Health and the Health Director. I was enough to get my mother and my mother in law over to the Hillview for their first round. Um, I missed out the first week. It was like trying to get concert tickets. I got them in the second week. And um, so that was one of my concerns. Of, I'm, I'm very reassured that they're able to go get their second dose there. Um, and I just, I, I can't thank you enough for what you did. I know it had to be so much work and um, I appreciate that you got it done and it's really a shame that it, it's gonna go. But happy to see that, to hear that the first dose people will be able to get their second dose and that is reassuring. Good, thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. It, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. It just seems like though that our, our board and our, our people that are administering it here have to kind of keep the powder dry until this revamps itself or changes again, possibly. Does that fair to say? I, I would say, Madam Chair, I think that the, the good thing is, is that if the timeline works out with two more weeks of first doses and then four weeks of second doses after that, that hopefully will have a different model, which is hopefully retaining a local model sometime in that six weeks so that we won't be, you know, sort of shuttering the doors and being hopeful that we'll be able to just build on what's already ongoing. And I know, I know Ms. Gonzalez touched on concert tickets and that gives rise to one of the, I think, positive, hopefully positive developments and feedback that I've heard, I know Bruce has heard, is when you're trying to schedule an appointment, much like you do for getting movie or concert tickets, you go in, you pick your seat, and then your, your, your seat is held for five or six minutes sort of why you complete the transaction, if you will, i.e., in this case, getting maybe your medical information in, your date of birth, all the other things in there. So all of a sudden you don't say, okay, I just put it in. Oh, wait a second, my, my appointment is gone now. Um, it, it, it seems like a no-brainer uh, to me. Uh, again, I'm not necessarily a tech person and I realize there are a lot of different platforms, but that seems to me to be a component that would be um, hopefully easily added and, and sensibly added to uh, the platform going forward, because that's one of the biggest complaints I've heard is I said, oh, go to an appointment here. By the time I got information in, it was gone. So give me five minutes to get my information in. I'm not asking you to hold it forever, but give me five minutes and I'll, I'll hopefully be able to get in, you know, my five questions, which hopefully are, most people have pretty readily available. And, and use a Massachusetts IT vendor for that. Don't use an out of state. We are the best of the best right here in Massachusetts. Pick from the best of the best and we might not have these issues. That's editorializing. I apologize for that. But um, the vendor we're using in North Reading too. So but I guess we have to. Mrs. Hovey, you have your hand raised. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'd like to thank uh, the Board of Selectmen and our esteemed guests, Senator Tarr uh, and Representative Jones, as well as um, residents and friends of North Reading. Um, I've only been in this situation for a very short period of time, but I realize the commitment that no, not only the, um, the Board of Health, um, Mr. Bracey, Mr. Murphy, and, um, and Pam um, have 
and and Mr. O'Leary um, to and and um, Mr. Hunt as far as their commitment to this program. Number one. Um, number two, they are working on that um, that aspect of holding the name until the whole process is completed. That, that's a new aspect that has just recently um, been addressed um, because that was one of the big concerns. I do have a lot of um, concerns about um, our elderly population because they were so very, they were so very um, appreciative of being able to come to the Hillview um, and we're very concerned about having to go elsewhere. Um, there are horrible um, stories where um, a woman I know, her 92 year old mother and she waited two hours in the cold um, outside Gillette Stadium. And um, my, my concern is all these elderly with their comorbidities will have secondary issues. Um, COVID, COVID being one of them, but um, their, their, um, their ability to contact um, pneumonias and um, frostbite, and we could go on and on and on. Um, however, that being said, you, you end up with an ethics um, situation as well, the ethical situation. We have a responsibility to our residents and we're not getting the support um, on what, whatever level um, to provide that, um, that support and, and that uh, health care. You know, they say all politics is local. Uh, Tim O'Neill said that a number of years ago, but all health care is local as well. And I can't tell you how appreciative um, the elderly population was. Um, coming through this, the, um, the clinics. And what an excellent job um, Director Bracey has done and Pam as far and, and, and the whole team as far as setting it up. So it, you go right through, it's exactly the way it should be. And we can expand that or we can hone it down to what we've been doing, but it's that whole process is easily expandable. And I, I compliment them on that. So being new to the situation um, with, a, with a different kind of, of eye, I see how, um, how complete it is and, and how patient focused it is. And I just, I don't want us to lose that for the community because they are our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So this is just kind of a recurring theme here and hopefully they'll re return it back to the local local boards and the local officials to administer. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a, a couple of comments I'd like to add. And um, Ms. Hubby uh, brought up a great point talking about the feedback from the elderly. And uh, there is a group that's not on the call here this evening, but the uh, folks over at the Council on Aging, the director, Mary Crenny, the administrative assistant, Sherry Greer, the outreach worker, um, Susan Tilton, they've worked very hard to um, assist in getting people connected with appointments, be it at the Hillview Clinic or at clinics elsewhere here in town. They were doing so before the uh, statewide two-on-one system was up and running and, and met the need um, very early on. Um, and they have been an active part at the clinics, uh, greeting people and facilitating folks' interaction there. So I, I know they're not on the call this evening, but I do wanna recognize them for their efforts in bridging the gap between the, the, the medical services being offered and the community that's being served at this point in time by those clinics. Um, secondly, Madam Chair, I, you know, I just to echo the comments. I mean, we, we have had, you know, from the very beginning of the pandemic and certainly well before that, a, a very open and candid discussion about any of the issues that are facing the town here with Representative Jones and with Senator Tarr, and they have, they have always been responsive. And once again, you know, when this issue has come up, um, they have provided us you know, honest and candid feedback about the challenges that the state is, is, uh, is facing and a, a commitment as recently as today and again this evening to advocate on behalf of both the uh, local clinics to the extent that they can, as well as for um, the right regional solution here, if there's an ability to add capacity in the area for North Reading residents. So um, I know that there's a, obviously a lot of challenges, but um, I'm on the phone with them um, regularly. 
with regard to these matters. And they, they have always um, stepped up and advocated. And they've always told us, you know, straight up when, you know, what we're looking to do is going to be a challenge and, and what we have to do to get past it. And um, this has been no different. I, I want to thank them for their efforts. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. All right. Any other questions, comments? Just once again, I want to applaud Pam that's efforts uh, on behalf of uh, the community and particularly during this pandemic, you know, public health nurse and uh, now turning over the reins to Donna, but also willing to continue to serve, which is uh, so important to us for continuity and uh, the expertise that she's developed and brings to the table is phenomenal. And again, uh, Pam, thank you very much for your service and uh, your continuing service uh, to the community. It's greatly appreciated. Most likely we're going to find you and bring you back somehow. <laughs> <laughs> She's staying on the board, so. Don't, don't go, don't, yeah, right. We're going we're gonna to make, we're going to continue making use of your uh, service. So, um, and I know we have on the agenda to recognize, to introduce and recognize you, even though Chair, Chair Hunt did do that and we have been doing that. So. Madam, um, Madam Chair. Mr. Mr. Gilberto. May I, may I proceed with an introduction? Just have a couple comments, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Gary, is that okay? Do you mind if I go? Please. <laughs> so first, um, and I know that Gary mentioned her earlier, but Stephanie Connolly from the uh, Public Health Department, um, you know, she really has been keeping us moving forward, you know, everything from setting up the website, website. Um, and the, the appointments that need to be made for the appointments, the staffing, the clinic, check in and check out when necessary. So. Um, thank you to Stephanie for her efforts as well. Um, with regard to the public health nurse, um, I would describe that uh, it is a, a position that's in transition um, in terms of we have um, you know Pam who is uh, continuing to assist us with our, our vaccination clinics and with monitoring Maven. And, and I know that I've said it before and um, and I, I can't I can't say it strongly you know strongly enough. Pam, Pam did not sign up for this. She stepped forward to help us out and to be a bridge between the longtime nurse and the, the next person to sit in the seat. That was two years ago. And um, she has just, you know, had this pandemic thrust upon her and has, um, you know, risen to the challenge in a way that um, honestly wasn't fair of the town to expect of her. But she has done that um, day in and day out, week in and week out. Um, in, in the best interest of the community when she could otherwise um, be retired and not working every day on this. And so I really just can't stress enough the community's gratitude for her efforts. Um, this is not goodbye though. She, uh, I think is gonna continue to help us out a little bit and um, will continue to be a board of a health member as well, which we're really glad to, to hear. Um, but we thought this was a great moment to recognize her and then to also introduce Donna. Uh, who is here again? Just a little bit of information on Donna. Donna has um, she graduated graduated from the Massachusetts General Hospital School of Nursing. She has a bachelor's degree uh, in nursing. She has a master's degree in public policy, and I believe is also a candidate for uh, a nurse practitioner uh, degree as well. Is that right, Donna? Um, it's a doctorate in nursing practice. Oh. Doctorate in nursing practice. Thank in you. Executive I, leadership. Yes. <laughs> she comes to us with um, Thank uh, you. much like uh, Pam has um, decades of experience in various positions of uh, direct ner uh, nursing service division and nursing administration as well. Uh, most recently working out of, I believe, is it St. Mary's in Hoboken? New Jersey, do I have that right? Well, you know, it's interesting because it's changed hands a couple of times. So it's now CarePoint Health. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, you know, we welcome Donna here. We want the community to see her. Some of you have been to the clinic already and have met Donna, um, but um, we want to stress that uh, you'll see her there um, uh, 4 p.m. or both administering vaccinations. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Pam very much for taking the call, I think three times, asking her to stay on. <laughs> I didn't even have to block my uh, my my number when I called her. <laughs> I heard some audio that. I did too. Okay. I. 
I know. Um, before I turn to my colleagues, I just wanted to give Representative Jones and Senator Tarr just one more opportunity if there's anything else, because I know you're busy. We know you're so dedicated to us and we really appreciate you joining us. And we know you are both working around the clock. So um, we want to give you the chance to give any final comments and go because we know you have other stuff you're working on for us. And we just thank you for being here too. Well, I thank the opportunity um, to come on tonight. I was actually thinking if Mr. Studo has ever had the opportunity to meet his other board members since I think his election took place during the pandemic and they've ever met in person, but I realize it's not meeting, but um, this this format is, uh, is very challenging and people are getting very adept at it. Uh, although I have to say, I look forward back to going to the days where we can actually go to town hall uh, and meet face to face. Uh, and hopefully that light is, while it's still at the end of the tunnel, hopefully the tunnel is getting shorter. Um, but, uh, and I would also say that, that the town uh, administrator is, uh, um, understates how often we talk. Um, he's not shy about reaching out either by phone or text, uh, pretty much seven by 24 if the need arises. Uh, and we're happy to try to be responsive as best we can. Um, and occasionally have to give him news he doesn't want to hear, but feel it's more important to try to give an honest answer than the answer we think he wants to hear. Um, so uh, that said, uh, happy to try to continue to be of help, both on the vaccine front um, uh, and other issues that uh, we face as a community in the Commonwealth. We appreciate it. We really appreciate it. We do. He does. He quietly does things for us, just like you do. So, and we know it's kind of around the clock endeavor for both of you. But I think we, I think we pretty well have expressed, uh, and I think the board board has expressed that you know we really would like to keep this in the local hands to be able to fight this and get as many people vaccinated as possible. But we also know you're gonna you're gonna take that to any ear that'll listen and, and try to get that accomplished if possible. So thank you so much for joining us. And Senator Tarr, I don't know if there's anything else you want like to say or add or. Well, I, I would uh, only add um, my thanks again um, to all of the members of the board for the relationship that you have with us. Most often that manifests itself through direct communication with the town administrator, um, who was a fantastic uh, representative on your behalf. Uh, but we also appreciate all of your concern um, and your partnership with us. And of course, I want to say thank you to Pam. Um, who I don't think could possibly have imagined um, what was going to be entailed here um, and just to say thank you. And also thank you to Donna, who knowing what's happening here has still agreed to move forward, uh, which is, I think, really important. And, you know, that that's what makes the town of uh, North Reading such a great place is that it has people willing to step up to the plate and help their neighbors. And that's why it's important that we try to keep vaccinations as local as possible and uh, Brad and I will continue to work for that goal. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both for coming and giving us the Thank information. You. Thank you. Yeah. Have a Ms. good Bath day. Is, I think Ms. Bath is raising her hand, Ms. Madam Chair. Oh, yes. Yes. Good afternoon, good evening. If I could just have two seconds, uh, I would like very much to be able to thank Mr. Gilberto for all his kind comments. And I would not have been able to do this at all had I not had the support of Mr. Gilberto and the select board for my appointment as the public health nurse of five hours a week, uh, which is what I agreed to for that. <laughs> but I do want to say thank you to them and also to a few other folks first, of course, uh, to Bob Bracey, our health director, who's always been there offering me new and ongoing challenges every day <laughs> and supporting me um, when I needed it and so much on Sunday. Thank you. And also Chief Murphy for his support during these recent challenges. Thank you. Next, Stephanie Con Connolly, our unsung hero at the health department who was able to prepare me for the next step each day, keep me up to date, keep me on schedule and help me make my workload manageable. Thank you very, very much, Stephanie. And Donna, I do not believe how helpful she is to you. And to those who taught me so much about our community and included me in my thoughts on how it might be helpful. Mary Pranny at the Senior Center, Amy Lukovitz and Marcy Bailey 
on the Coalition for Substance Abuse, it's Jen Ford and, and Laura Miranda, who included me. Um, they began developing new programs and thoughts um, and taught me what the town provides and what it might provide to both adults and children. And also a special thanks to the school nurses who have done a phenomenal job identifying and notifying um, students, staff, teachers, all about um, isolation and quarantine and being able to keep the schools as safe as they are. I am at this time a little sad because I'm not gonna be having my finger in all of these issues every day, but I'm very proud to be able to say, I wanna continue with my um, Board of Health position and I will be available for calls from certain people if they need me. Um, it's been a little lonely as Donna has stepped up and begun doing her job. And I'm wondering why I didn't get a call from somebody. It's because Donna's already taken care of it. But thank you very, very much for all of your thoughts and your well wishes. And we certainly, I will be right here. Um, although I do plan to take a little trip south for some warm weather in the next few weeks. Thank you again very much. Thank you. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues for comment because I'm sure they have a few things for you too. Mr. O'Leary. Well, I made my comments about Pam, obviously, you know, I won't say irreplaceable, but I'll tell you, that was the best five hours a week we ever contracted for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, it really got uh, him. We appreciate it so much and, and appreciate your willingness to continue to serve. And, uh, and again, to Gary and uh, Karen and Donna and everybody else, uh, really, the efforts that you're putting in now is uh, unbelievable. And I, I know people appreciate it, but they really don't have an appreciation for, for all that it's taking. So, um, again, just want to recognize your, your efforts. And again, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Again, when we spoke last Wednesday at your meeting, I just thought it was important for you to come here and articulate in a little bit, a little bigger forum. Um, and I think you've gotten the message out loud and clear. And uh, I hope people have a greater appreciation for all that you've done so far and will continue to do. So again, thank you very much. And Pam, enjoy it, you know, and uh, block Michael's call, you know, <laughs> block his number. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Walner. Um, there's, there's been a, I, I'm learning tonight what's been going on. So it's a lot deeper than I ever imagined. So I really do appreciate everything that the board has done and, uh, looking out for the health of our citizens is great. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Waller. Mr. Studo, you're all set. Are you ready? Yeah, no, I just reiterate that point. I mean, it's, uh, I, I can, I, it's nice to know that like, it seems like we, you know, it, if we can just sometimes at the local level, we can handle things a certain way. And, you know, I just, I, I never heard that angle yet of how disruptive it actually was. So, you know, I want to thank everybody who put in a lot of time and then, you know, hopefully as this progresses, nothing's set in stone and, you know, we can get back to kind of helping at the local level. Ms. Gonzalez. Yeah. I just want to thank all of you for coming, including, um, Mr. Tarr and Mr. Jones and um, just shedding light. You know, there's nothing worse than rumors and hearsay and everybody not really having facts and, you know, pointing fingers and whatever. I mean, you've all shed light on this. You've made us all understand what's going on and what's happening going forward. And that's just so important. So I really appreciate you all taking the time to do mm -hmm. that. And, um, and also I'd like to thank Mrs. Bath for everything. I've never gotten to meet you personally. So it was very nice to meet you tonight. Although Zoom, but um, it's as good as we're gonna get right now. <laughs> and I wish you all the luck. And, and, and thank you also Mrs. Hovey for stepping forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, ditto, ditto with that. Mrs. Vath, you were in the right place at the right time, I guess, you know? So so <laughs> we made good use of your service and we appreciate your continued service and welcome to you, Mrs. Hovey. So thank you very much for joining us and to the um, Board of Health too. Um, also to, to Mr. O'Leary, who's 
our liaison. He's been keeping us regularly updated at every meeting. I know you're meeting regularly, which you always did, but uh, this requires a, li a lot more time and attention and devotion of your, of your time. And I'm sure these things are weighing on you. You don't just finish your meeting and stop thinking about it. So we appreciate your service and uh, trying to help us through this difficult difficult time. So thank you. And I don't know if there's anything else you want to say, Mr. Hunt. Well, just, just one brief comment. Uh, this town is very blessed to have had the, my colleagues from the Board of Health and the Health Department available when this pandemic hit. We didn't plan for it. We didn't expect it. it became obvious to us about a year ago that something was cooking and it's been cooking since and uh, we've responded accordingly. Uh, Pam was uh, successful in convincing Donna to leave New Jersey to come to Ma back to Massachusetts. I used to live in New Jersey. That's not that hard of a pitch. <laughs> and and uh, so I think uh, I, I just want to, and I want to recognize all of the, the board of selectmen and the town administrators and, the, and Mr. Murphy for all their support. I mean, this, this would not have happened as well as it did if it hadn't been for all those people. It could have been a, could have been a lot more devastating for this community. Mm. And um, I just want to acknowledge all of them and it's a pleasure to work with them. Great. All right, well, thank you. Tim, I think we're ready to move on. Yeah, Next yeah. order of business. You don't so have to you. hang around for it either. No, I know, you <laughs> don't, thank you. Thanks. Canada, thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you all for joining us. Thank we appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. See you later. Okay, next order of business. Discuss the proposed zoning change at 148 to 150 Park Street area. And Mr. Gilberto. I believe um, attorney Latham is on here and I thought I saw Mr. Wheeler sign on as well. Um, to the members of the board, you should have received an email from me, um, I think this morning with a link to information we put in the meeting folder for this evening provided by, um, I believe Mr. Latham. It's a PowerPoint presentation, some warrant article language, um, uh, rendering and I believe uh, in a, a, a zoning type map. Um, but, okay. So, so can you, you, Madam Chair, can we maybe turn it over to Mr. Latham? I sure, Latham. we'll recognize Attorney Latham. Welcome. Hey, thank Good you, evening. Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much for the for the board's time tonight. We'll I'll try to make it as quickly as possible. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? It may be. Of faster. course. Okay. Of course. So I'm do that now. Is that all right, Mr. Gilberto? I think you need to. Okay. Okay. So. Um, First off, I want to just direct the board quickly to the North Reading Master Plan. And I'm going to scroll quickly through to, obviously I've highlighted some areas, but I want to scroll through quickly to the demographic trends. Um, and I'll, I'll read it, but obviously you can see it as well. The growing uh, senior demographic in North Reading has need for smaller housing types and the demand for this demographic uh, will continue to grow from 2000 to 2010. The population of single person households 65 years and older increased by 44% and another 9% from 2010 to 2015. There are currently 477 single person senior households and one quarter of them uh, claim a disability. Uh, likewise, on page 11 of, the, of this 2020-2030 uh, master plan, it also notes that um, the population of seniors in North Reading is expected to double between 2010 and 2030. And so to continue on, elderly households will have difficulty in maintaining larger single family homes because of ownership costs potential repairs and the work capacity needed to take care of these homes, seniors may want to downsize to something that is more cost effective and easier to ma manage. Many of them will, can, uh, will want to remain in North Reading, um, but will have difficulty finding housing once they re-enter the market and are subject to the high cost of current rentals. 
uh, the group needs a range of different housing types that allows them to downsize and sometimes live off a of fixed income so they can remain in North Reading. If not, they will be forced to look to different options in places where rentals and smaller housing types are available. A lack of housing options for seniors also has implications for other demographics in the North Reading housing markets. Um, these include, these households are overhoused and if they don't have options to downsize, this housing won't be freed up for families. Um, so, there has been support both in the 2018 and it's stated again in the 2020 um, master plan uh, for support of housing near the historic center. And I believe the 2018 master plan actually noted that there was some support um, for potentially having more senior uh, housing uh, down in the historic center. And so it's, it's listed in the master plan, obviously some housing, achieve, are, you know, overarching housing goals, uh, obviously housing for seniors, provide affordable, appropriate housing for seniors, uh, allows them to remain in North, North Reading, and also housing options, provide a variety of options that increase naturally occurring uh, and affordable housing. Um, for the board's reference, um, there's goal 8D of the master plan, which talks about potentially setting up pocket neighborhoods. And the one that's probably most significant um, to what we are talking about, I will scroll down to that for the board's quick reference. Um, there we go, right there, sorry. Um, housing options are needed for seniors. Um, obviously these housing options should be, not be limited to, uh, to only within a rezone mixed use residential main street, but also a different extent within certain um, nearby smaller residential neighborhoods. Um, and if we could, recommendation 9.3 is to prioritize the development of more housing for seniors, single person households that meet universal design ADA standards. And likewise, um, just quickly scroll down, uh, recommendation 22.1. Um, housing options needed for seniors, young adults, etc. cetera. Um, so with that being said, um, we have uh, put together, we've been working with the CPC uh, for a while now. And for the board's reference, uh, we're actually going to be appearing before the CPC again on March 2nd. Uh, we believe that they are going to be uh, assisting in terms of sponsoring uh, this particular zoning bylaw. But obviously, it's a work in progress. We, we did meet with FINECOM. And since we met with FINECOM last week, we have actually made a modification. We heard the fine con basically state that they wanted the affordable housing to be located within the project, within the, the location. And so we have made modifications to the, the, um, the bylaw that was before the fine con to incorporate that. And I believe the board, I don't know if you've all had a chance to read it, but basically um, this is it. And so um, it's an overlay district like many zoning districts in, in North Reading. And basically what it's designed to do is um, it, it uses a lot of definitions, most of the definitions that are state and federal law and the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Smart Growth, although this is not a 40R, uh, and it uses good land use criteria to seek to provide independent housing units for, ha for persons over the age of 55. It allows aging North Reading residents uh, who are seniors options to downsize and remain in town. It simultaneously is designed to try to revitalize and vitalize further the downtown and to preserve the character of the town. And to achieve these objectives, the overlay district is designed uh, so that the Hassini housing project must consist of four or more acres of land within walking distance, that's 250 feet from our estimation, of a public park, public common, or public library with at least 200 feet of frontage on the property that would be developed specifically 146, 148, 150 Park Street in mind. And it would allow for multiple buildings, including mixed use and a senior housing project, so long as all principal buildings have a minimum site distance of 20 feet between buildings. Um, the buildings do not cover more than 40% of the gross site area. New buildings for senior housing have setbacks of 25 feet from the front lot line, 20 feet from the side, and 20 feet from a rear, and a maximum height of 45 feet. Um, the project has a minimum proposed open space of at least 20% of the total area, and new buildings must be in harmony uh, in design with the neighborhood, uh, including use of peaked roofs uh, and end gables. 
With that being said, we've actually uh, appeared before the uh, Historic District Commission and we've received their comments in terms of the proposed architectural plans. And they are actually a work in progress. We're actually working on that. We're gonna be going back to the Historic District Commission with revised plans, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, so the senior housing project must also have an on-site senior common area amen amenity uh, for the use of senior residents. And there will be elevator for uh, new multi-floor residential structures, which must also have handicap access um, from parking garage, there's a proposed parking garage underneath, to dwelling units. And the density would be uh, limited, so a dwelling unit cannot be more than two bedrooms, and the total number of dwelling units uh, in a senior housing project does not exceed 50 units. In addition, the applicant for the, house, uh, for the senior housing uh, development must contribute to the stock of affordable home ownership units in town equal to 10% of the market rate residential units. And those must be located now as, as we've revived based on FineCon's comments, um, those affordable units must be located within the senior housing project. Um, we've used basically Commonwealth's, uh, the Commonwealth's inclusionary zoning model bylaw. Um, and basically um, we've used uh, affordable housing restrictions in the bylaws and DHCD regulations and, and trying to compose this. Um, so with that, with that said, um, let me see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to minimize this and go back. Okay, so this is what we're proposing right now for the location of the, of the proposed senior housing overlay district. And obviously this is the library here, as you know, in the town common. It's located right next door to the police and fire department. Um, it's right on Park Street. And as part of the proposal, and this is what we've been in uh, conversation with the historic district commission in regards to, is locating the historic uh, McLean house. Um, so basically it's on a, um, a field stone and, and uh, uh, rubble foundation. And so the proposal is to put it on a permanent foundation that gives it more support and hopefully will allow it to uh, survive for hundreds of more years. Um, and uh, so that's that aspect of it. Um, and so at this point, um, I would like to turn it over to um, Craig Seymour, who is here tonight. And after that, uh, Larry Reeves, if he's available, and if Peter has any comments, Peter Ogren, he's here as, here as well. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let us know. So I think uh, I think uh, I think we may have a couple of questions of the you know proposal from board members. That, you know, maybe we can uh, you know if, if anyone has them now, if you if you I, you can answer them, Attorney Latham, and if. If not, maybe your, the individuals that you just identified could too. Um, yeah. But I see Mr. Vin, Mr. Studo's hand, Mr. Vincent, um, Mr. Studo's hands up. So. Attorney Latham, uh, nice to see you again. I know that um, I've listened to your proposal, so I've uh, I didn't think I was have any questions because I've heard it a couple of times TPC. But can you just because you referenced it a couple of times in a change made, can you please uh, let us know what the comments were at FinCom? Yes, I'm, I'm kind of in the dark with that. Yes, sir. So um, basically, I spoke with um, planning director Danielle McKnight this morning, and we met with FineCom last week. And um, the big takeaway that we uh, got out of FineCom last week was that they basically wanted the um, affordable housing units to be located on site. Uh, the way that it had previously been drafted, there were a couple different options which were consistent with, with basically the state's model plan, but basically um, it would have allowed for some of the uh, units to be located offsite, and it also um, had an option for uh, a payment in lieu of. And so um, based on what our takeaway from the FINECOM was, is that it was pretty clear to us that the members of FINECOM wanted the uh, proposed affordable units to be located actually on the site where the senior housing uh, project is located. Do you know how, um, and, and again, maybe because I, I like, I'm, I'm a little bit newer to this, but so, you know, maybe I missed that because it just didn't come up in CPC in any of those meetings. So before, I, can you explain to me how they would have been offsite a little bit more? 
Yeah, uh, possibly uh, it could be through another development or the purchase of other property. They could be located off the okay. property through another property's uh, purchase. And what did that um, that suggestion from the finance committee, and then you, and then you taking, you know, making the changes? What did that do for the for the numbers that are different than what I've seen at CPC? Well, what what we're proposing currently is um, fifty residential units, of which ten uh, percent or five would be affordable units. Okay. Previously, we had sort of played with the idea of 48 units, um, but at this point, since we're doing it on site, we thought at that point, economically, it makes sense to to basically have the 50 units. Okay. So two, the increase is only two. Yes, sir. Okay. So, okay. That's, that was, thank you. Thank you. Um, Attorney Latham, uh, does, do any of my colleagues have any more questions for Attorney Latham? No, uh, Mr. O'Leary. I'm sorry. Just uh, no, I, I too. You know, since this is the first time you've uh, presented it to the board here, uh, I too uh, would advocate the affordability. You know, on site. Uh, so I'm glad that you've incorporated that into uh, your proposal and also into the proposed bylaws. Uh, the only other question I have, uh, and again, I, I'll see how this unfolds and um, see how the rest of the other boards uh, you know, either endorse or look for modifications, but um, you know, the concept is pretty good. And, um, but again, the affordability, affordable units are, are key. But as far as uh, right now, uh, is there any uh, willingness on the part of um, uh, Mr. Wheeler to, uh, to grant a permanent easement for the public safety building? Because right now we're, we're, we're utilizing part of the parcel uh, for access to the public safety building. Um, and I don't know if there was going to be a permanent easement uh, granted where you wouldn't lose any um, acreage, but you also wouldn't uh, deny the public safety facility uh, access to the to its building and behind the building. Uh, I actually was not aware of that, but uh, we, we can obviously look into that. Um, I don't know. Peter Ogren's here. I don't know. He's the uh, engineer from Hayes Engineering. I don't know if he was aware of that. He's, he he's been around a while. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Hello. Hello, Bruce. Um, yeah, I, I was I was not aware that that entrance actually went over, and, and uh, we were not showing the topo plan tonight. But I do have a topo and a and a boundary survey. Uh, I'll look into it. I if if that uh, paved area goes over it, I, I'm sure we can accommodate. Uh, you know, uh, it, I mean, we don't lose any land area to grant an easement, and I'm sure we'd be we willing to do that. Uh, if you could just take a look at it, you know, you know, uh, yeah. what, what the actual layout is and what uh, currently is being utilized by public sa safety uh, personnel and equipment, that would be great. Yeah, we can do that. And actually, part of our uh, proposal is to, uh, when we put the McLean House on a new foundation, is to improve the site distance. I'm sure you're aware that the yeah. site distance of the public safety building is a, a bit compromised in that uh, easterly direction. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Attorney Latham, I think if none of the other members have a question, I do have a question. This overlay district that you've proposed, this involves just one parcel that's all owned by the same owner. It, it actually uh, was three parcels and uh, Mr. Wheeler has now um, just recently purchased the other uh, parcel. So it, it's a total of three parcels, I think, according to the assessors. Um, but now it is in common ownership. You're right, Madam Chair. Okay, so it's all owned by the same owner. Mm -hmm. Where you're proposing to to for this overlay, and yeah. in the um, in the language of the proposed bylaw, mm -hmm. you are defining the affordable housing, and you're 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 following along on our zoning bylaw, which is actually the definitions in the Berry zoning, the Berry overlay zoning for affordable housing that meets the same definition as HUD qualifications for the Boston region. Yes, So it's based upon our region's median income range. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we proceed? 
is, yeah. is the planning commission planning on doing anything more with the uh, proposing it if we're going to propose this change uh, another section of the community uh, to be included in the proposal for the overlay district are we aware maybe vincenzo you know because i get uh, a, a rich no, i can um rich do you want to i mean do you want to speak on or i i can i i i think i have the answer no, go ahead, Vincenzo. It's fine. Uh, from my understanding, no. This would not, at the at not current moment. Because I think it would be worth everybody's while if there's a, another section or two in the community uh, that would be suitable. It could help assist us in, uh, you know, increasing our affordable housing uh, needs and, uh, and, 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 and limiting the impact as far as, um, you know, the number of units that would be anywhere, so. You know, on the bylaws, you can accomplish that by requiring the specific number in the overlay district if it's permitted, you know, to be affordable. Yeah, so it's again, written right, right in there. Right. And if there are other parcels within the community that, uh, you know, have come to light, then maybe would be uh, suitable uh, for such a proposal. Maybe we should uh, encourage the Planning Commission to take a look at it that way also, if if all the boards are going to get on board and try and uh, support this. And I'd like to add too, and Mr. Latham, maybe you can, you, you spoke to it to the CPC multiple times, but can you please speak, uh, speak to the board of why it is not considered spot zoning, which is something that did come up? Yes. So um, basically uh, it's not spot zoning because it's generally an overlay district. And that combined with the fact that it's consistent with the town's master plan, it's the public benefit that they look at. And the fact <clears> that we believe that this addresses, um, it doesn't solve North Reading's problems, but it gives a significant um, silver bullet to some extent in trying to deal with uh, the fact that you have uh, an aging population um, that is overhoused and they need alternatives. North Reading only has 13% um, of its housing stock is condominiums. This project is proposed to be condominium. So that will increase the, the uh, options that are available, increase the diversity of housing. Um, so we believe there's a strong public benefit um, because it's, it's hitting some of these very important aspects um, that the town has actually uh, recognized in its own master plan. Um, we believe also it's a public benefit because it's, uh, for senior housing is directly abutting, um, you know, emergency services. Uh, we believe it's going to help, uh, you know, revitalize downtown um, and the size of the parcels. It's a it's a pretty good sized parcel. So um, for that for those reasons, we believe that it's it's a, a benefit to the town, um, and we don't believe it's going to be considered spot zoning. Um, the town actually has a smaller. Uh, zoning district, the residential M district, um, which is uh, at least an acre smaller than than this particular uh, district. Thank you. Mr. Walmer. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, since I mean it is supposed to be to help our seniors, we do have an extremely fast growing demographic here. I think it's going to be forty percent by the time frame you talked about. Um, the question is, does this include local preference housing? I mean, it's intended to benefit North Reading. We want to be sure that North Reading people get the first options to get into the affordable and the other units as well. Could you comment on that, please? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, there is uh, a North Reading preference that we built in based upon the comments by the CPC. Um, it was probably within the last month or so. So there actually is a provision in the uh, that gives preference uh, particularly for the affordable housing units um, to North Reading residents to the extent that it's allowed by law. Um, I, I did a project up in Ipswich and Ipswich had a, had a preference as well. Um, it wasn't written into the, um, um, obviously we weren't doing a bylaw change up there, but basically it was part of, um, of how it was handled up there and, and it was successful. Good, thank you. I just had two questions, two more questions, if that's okay, Attorney Latham. On this picture, I know in our presentation, we saw, uh, I guess, a design, but it didn't sh quite show how, yeah, we saw this, but and it, it's easy to picture that, I, I think, because we dri if we've driven by it over and over again, but how the river is right behind that, Ipswich River is right behind that. so. I would have how 
I haven't seen anything. I don't know if you can draw and pull something up that shows exactly where this would be in connection to the Ipswich River. Because right, it's right there, right? Mm. Oh, I don't think this was in my packet. Okay. The, 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 the river is, is uh, it, it shows on this plan, and you're correct, it's behind it, but there's a significant wetland. Uh, the wetlands have actually been mapped, uh, and uh, uh, there's a significant wetland before you get to the river. So this is not even within the riverfront area or under the conservation regulations. Uh, we're more than 200 feet from the bank of the river everywhere. And, uh, and we have uh, mapped the, uh, or the wetlands have been mapped uh, and we're only using the upland areas that will only involve a buffer zone activity as far as the wetlands are concerned. But does it, but it will go, it'll have to go to the conservation commission for a review though, because it abuts the river. Uh, we will have the, the, the thing that will uh, most likely uh, uh, lead to uh, conservation involvement is an activity within 100 feet of the bordering vegetated wetland. You got the river and you have the riverfront area, which is 200 feet from the uh, bank of the river, but then you also have uh, 100 feet from uh, the bordering vegetated wetland. And so uh, we'll have activity within that area that will bring us to the conservation and bring us into uh, stormwater management as well. Uh, but we've done preliminary soils investigations and, and uh, we've got you know, preliminary engineering done. So we think we can meet all the criteria that they have set forth. So I guess um, what we're looking at, Peter, where if, if you're able to point out, because I'm, I know it's, I'm trying to, I'm trying to imagine where the build out would be on this. And I don't know if it, is it shown on this? Uh, no, the build out isn't shown on this. That's on another plan, Brad. Do you, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Chris, do you have that? Uh... Yeah, so I think what I saw was kind of like a PowerPoint presentation, but I don't remember seeing it like a bird's eye view of where the building would be as in, yeah, this, I saw this, but. Yeah. Okay. You have that plan, don't you, Chris? Yes, I'm, at, I'm well, if, if it's on this plan, I do. Um, I don't think it's on this. This is the oh, one that we got today. Yeah, th this is, uh, this is Craig's plan as to the financials. Um, I don't think I have that one, Peter. Okay, well, the architect has it. Uh, I, I think he could share his screen. I, I don't have it on my screen. So, Larry, do you have it that you can pull it up? Larry Reeve was on. I saw him. I'm <laughs> muted here. There we go. Now I can talk. Okay. Yes, uh, I do have that. Uh, if I can... I'm going to stop sharing my screen then. All right. And let's see if I can get shared. There we go. So this is um, this is our overall site, uh, and and the green area is really the what we'll call the development site in effect. Um, the this rectangle is the, is an exist the existing um, building the the steel company building, um, and actually if we. I don't know if we can hop back, but in that, that previous uh, plan, that building is located probably in the upper third of, right at the base of the upper third of the overall property between uh, Park Street and the river. That uh, this green area is, is approximately half of the site. Um, I, I want to say, is that about right, Peter? Yeah, I would say that... Uh... That, that the, the steel building maybe comes down to about half the site. It actually shows on our perimeter plan. Right. So this, but as far as the, um, <clears throat> right, the current uh, wetlands line, but is also the, uh, the, the rear parking area, we'll, we'll call it, it's sort of the turnaround and storage and all sorts of fun things uh, that, that happen adjacent to the existing garage building. And we also have the uh, the four bay garage uh, that's that's up um, behind the McLean house, 
but it, it drops pretty steep and, and significantly down to this back area. But this is essentially a plateau um, right through here. And we're, we're confined really to that, that plateau uh, forward to Park Street. Uh, the tree line is also um, uh, is, is approximately the same spot. So the wetlands and tree line are, are kind of the, where, where the white part starts. So if that, if that helps in terms of the, the positioning. Yeah, definitely. I, that's what I was thinking that it, it, it doesn't really show from what we were given today, but it's, it's really right close to the, to the river. It, it's a lot of a lot, it's a lot bigger of a development in other words, than just the picture that we saw. That's, that's really what I wanted. I don't know if you have any other bird's eye views of it. Yeah, actually, um, oh, yes, as, let me just see if I have here, um, do you have a Sanborn? I, I might have to scroll to the, to the right spot. Um, <clears throat> Find the right map. Forward about a hundred years here. Let's see if it full, pulls in fully. I don't know that it does. You know, actually, um, Chris, this, this may be e easier for you. I, I'm going to stop share. If you can go back uh, to where Peter was. Uh, with with the full site, um, there there's some landmark lines that we can show. Go back to that site plan. There we go. So <clears throat> this this is the uh, the existing building. Oh, oh, I'm I'm. I might have have you point this, Chris, uh, with the existing building. Um, we have a, a four bay garage and the existing steel supply and the wetlands line runs from um, actually this the the bend in the property line behind the four bay garage from right there over to the the distinct bend on the right side right there so that's actually where our wet approximately the wetlands line is so you can see that there's still a huge buffer back to where the river area actually is. That's that's right. Yeah, the river is actually the southerly bound of the property, uh, save some other little piece of land that went with this that's across the river, which shows on the plan. Right. I don't know if that helps or, uh, or not. I mean, it, it does for me. That that was really only my question. I don't know if okay. any of my the board members were wondering about that. But the 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 overlay would permit the what you're proposing for a development that's really right close to the. Um, I'm just thinking of this because we have something proposed up the street, and it was. Uh, significant opposition to you know have a building so close to the to the river which you can understand obviously why the you know that would be of concern sure and um in the other thing that i wanted to ask you attorney latham is the in the proposal for i know you're saying 55 or over that hardly seems really you know elderly to me but in terms of what's there <laughs> i'm there the too most, I love that <laughs> <laughs> able to, well, i mean to qualify for more and more of these things now you know it seems like middle age more to me but um but the proposal says it doesn't and I forget what we did I, someone maybe maybe Steve can refresh my memory but on the on the um JT Berry was 55 and over two um, for the same sort of purpose of, um, you know, addressing the needs of, you know, 
our older residents stay, staying here, downsizing and staying here. But it, it, in the bylaw for the overlay proposal, it says just as long as one resident is 55 or old or over that complies. And that, I mean, I, I don't know if that's co a common proposed language. And of course you said you've been working already with the, the other boards on this, so. Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, we're open to what the boards uh, request. Um, when we were drafting this, we basically put it in in those terms because, um, being a private attorney, we've actually seen people who have been in situations like this, and it becomes a hardship um, because they want to buy in to prepare for their senior years, and they aren't able to because either the wife or the husband is not old enough. Um, so, and, and we also put in a two year time frame in case somebody passed away, because we've actually seen situations where that becomes a hardship for people as well. But um, we're, we're open to the board's suggestions if you have an, an, an alternative. I mean, I, I was, I was just noting it. So, and again, it's something I, that we, we received and I'm not sure if everyone's had the chance to kind of dissect and absorb it. So this presentation is certainly helpful. Um, but I, I don't know if any of the other members have any questions. What, what's the, um, what are you talking about as far as market rate on these things, uh, these units, uh, as far as affordability and what do you anticipate um, marketing them for dollar wise? Bruce, you want to take a crack at that? If you have any idea at this point, uh, we we don't have a specific price in mind uh, yet. I, I think that um, uh, we, we look at Martin's Landing and and feel like um, uh, it's a simple. Hope you're so, breaking up, Bruce. Yeah, uh, I, we we're, we 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 kind of uh, we don't have a specific price at this. At, at this point, but as a comparable, we look at Martin's Landing, and uh, we we uh, feel like we're going to have a uh, much more attractive building and a much more desirable location. Um, so it, it would be uh, some some percentage above uh, the 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 Martin's Landing pricing, but we really haven't gotten that far into it. Okay, and then as far as the uh, the sight lines for the entrance and egress uh, for the property, I mean, it is a tough spot. Uh, have you had any feedback from the planning commission as far as the site plan? And I, I don't know what you would do to, to enhance it. Uh, we can certainly, you, you need to retain the, the Jared McLean house for historical purposes. Um, yeah, yeah we're, 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 we actually did a study, a site distance study. We did uh, radar. Uh, speed gun analysis up there and, and looked at the 80, 80th, 80 percentile of uh, speed. And uh, we need, when we put the new foundation under the McLean house, we're going to move it. Uh, this, this plan that you see here uh, in the circle down on the left shows how we move it about 24 feet to the east and about, uh, I think it's four or five feet back. If you do that, it's, you end up with a, an adequate uh, stopping site distance for uh, our entrance and actually for the entrance to the uh, uh, right. entrance or egress to the public safety building as well. Yeah, obviously, if, you, if you're going to be uh, exiting the, the property and heading westbound, that's that's the danger. You know, eastbound is not so bad, but westbound is is difficult. But well, no, no, uh, it, it, the McLean House is blocking somebody right. turning east. Yeah, yeah, turning east. So what I'm saying is, someone yeah. trying to come out and go west. Is, is where the danger lies, right? Okay, but I'm not sure the planning commission is going to take a look at that. And comment yeah, on it, too. It's the westbound car that you don't have uh, any real sight distance at all. Right. right. And, and uh, frankly, the other uh, uh, access to this property we looked at, it's got a terrible uh, westerly sight distance. Uh, you really take your life in your hands leaving the automotive use to come out onto... Uh, the, the uh, street there, so. Correct, yep. I get my inspection stickers there. I have to find a new one. Hey, what, what's your timeline too on this, you know, depending on pending approval? Uh, I, so it, 
we would go to the the uh, June town meeting, and um, uh, and then I think we'd have a six to eight month permitting process with the CPC. Uh, so that would take us into early 2022. Okay. Madam Chair, um, I just quickly looked something up, and um, when when we drafted it, we were looking at the uh, the 55, as you said, and that is uh, in compliance with federal and state law because they they only require that uh, that one person be over 55. But um, that's just for your for your reference. Mm. I know that there's another uh, over 55 community in North Reading that has had an issue with, you know, the, a younger spouse, the older spouse dying. And again, uh, whether or not the people, the hardship was placed upon the surviving spouse and having to, to leave the facility because uh, it's going to be a while before they reach 55. I don't know how it got adjudicated, but it was going to court. So. So, um, Attorney Latham, is there, if, are you, um, are there other documents you wanted us to take a review of while you're uh, going over this? If, if I could turn it over to uh, Craig Seymour, he um, actually did the presentation before the FINECOM uh, to basically show the financial impact. So if, if Craig could take over, that'd be great. And I can stop sharing my screen and, and Craig can take over. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is Craig Seymour. I'm a uh, real estate economist and planner that's been working with communities like North Reading throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the country for that matter for the past 35 plus years. Um, in the interest of time, uh, you have my presentation in front of you, which was a compilation of the uh, estimated fiscal impacts of the project. Uh, and the fiscal impacts are the revenues that would be generated uh, through property taxes and other sources offset by the municipal service costs that would be uh, would result from these additional population and the uh, employment that would take place within the office component of this. Um, rather than bring it up again in the interest of time, because I know you have much more on your agenda, uh, just to summarize um, what we have, what I've come up with here is that this thing, and this is based on 30, uh, 48 units is going to generate annual revenues of about just under $400,000 a year, $393,600. And the municipal service costs for those municipal services that are going to change, that are variable relative to the population and employment, which is public safety, DPW, and general government, uh, are about one hundred and thirteen six. So it comes up with a, an annual positive fiscal impact of about $280,000 or a benefit cost ratio of 2.5. Um, there's also some upfront uh, revenues that will be generated by the town in terms of building permits and connection fees. Those are either used for inspections or flow into the general fund. And the connection fees, of course, go to the water department to offset any costs that they have. Um, that's a fiscal impact. The economic impacts primarily are more indirect and it's based upon the spending potential that the new residents will bring to, uh, to the town center of North Reading. Typically, households uh, that might occupy this spend anywhere from thirty-five to forty thousand dollars a year on retail and services, uh, disposable income. Five to six thousand dollars. This is based on on national averages. Five to six thousand that dollars of that is spent in restaurants and 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 taverns, and eight to ten thousand dollars in food and beverage stores. Some of those that funding, I can't say all of it, simply because you know people shopping habits are spread far and near. But I think the town of North Reading with the services that are private provided by uh, retailers and dining right in the village center, but also out on Main Street are gonna recoup some of that. So that's a, you know, it's a significant positive fiscal impact or economic impact. But I think also um, the intangibles is that it adds vitality to the town. It brings people who hopefully long-term residents who wanna stay in town can now be near the town hall in the park and, um, helping maintain uh, the town's character, which I know is very important to you and everyone else. And it's also a source of volunteers. As, a, as an elected official in my town, I'm on a board of trustees uh, and I run my cemetery here in my own town. You know how hard it is to get people to volunteer for any of the boards and committees and having those keep people stay in town and do that, I think is a big asset. So I'll end it there and just uh, be open to any questions you might have on some of the economic and financial issues. 
Okay. Do I have any, Mr. Studo? I have a question. Do we have any data from past projects of how much downsizing happens? And the only reason I ask is because that resident spending, right? If it's downsizing, then you got to take that out. I mean, if 25 people sell their single families in North Reading and then move in here, it's not like there's another, I mean, it's the same 25 people, unless you're counting the fact that then, you know, there'd be that chain effect of those 25. I'm just trying to, is that, is that what you're looking at, uh, Mr. Seymour? It's, you know, that's, it's a very good point. And it could well be uh, that some of that money is um, already being spent in North Reading. On the other hand, if it's someone who lives on the far reaches of North Reading, up on the Andover line or down on the Reading line, they're probably spending it in those communities or elsewhere at the shopping malls and stuff. What it does, though, because it's a, this is going to be a very walkable location, people are going to, they're not going to jump necessarily jump in their car and go out and run uh, errands for a lot of the essentials because they can essentially walk down the street and get it. And I think that's, uh, that's that money that's going to be, you know, that spending that's going to be captured. Uh, by these folks. It's not, it's not a big amount of money, but, you know, if you take those for the 48 uh, units here and you multiply that, that supports about 8,000 square feet of retail in total. Now, all of that's not going to be in, in the village center, obviously, uh, or on Park Street. But again, it is going to help the, the businesses that are there, giving them a little extra boost by having more, uh, you know, more um, customers nearby who are going to be spending some money there. Now we just got to build them some stores. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Put the town hall down there. It was well, there, there. It was there. there. We moved it. Right. The, the hornet's nest is there, and and uh, uh, the Dunkin general Donuts. store. <laughs> What's that? Dunkin' Donuts is down there. You know. Yeah, Dunkin' Donuts, and 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 the, there's a huge shopping mall that the Dunkin' Donuts is in. Okay, do, do any, does anyone else have any questions? Do my colleagues have any questions? If you don't, I do have a couple um, because I think what we, I think I'm struggling with not seeing this sort of superimposed on the site myself and, and just because you're presenting it. So I have a number of questions and I, 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 I feel the same. I don't mean to be offensive, but I feel the same about those numbers. You could pretty much plug in anything you want with those financial numbers. To me, the more concerning thing is that the, the density that this might impose and also the proximity to the, to the Ipswich, Ipswich River. And on the picture that you show, I know you're saying, uh, what we got was a picture. It's almost like a PowerPoint presentation. And there's a picture and it's, it's really, um, it shows the, you know, the, the front re, um, I guess, re, repositioned home and the picket fence and then a development there. I guess it doesn't show the whole thing though, if it's 48 units. So it must only show a very small portion of it. And that, I guess that's what I'm struggling with. If, if you're looking for support, at least from, you know, I'm only one of five, but I would like to see this sort of something showing the proposed build out. And I'm sure some, I'm sure because you've been working with all these other boards that you have that somewhere that you could show it on, you know, the site currently. I, I don't think I, I've seen that yet. Yeah, I, I know um, we've, we've seen the shed and the cars and things like that, but it doesn't really quite show it as it's proposed. And that's what I'd like to see. Larry Reeves, can you go back to that? The, the, the plan as the building superimposed. Um, yeah. On the In fact, I, I have a, I have a, a, a slightly we, we older. About, yeah. When we were, when we were describing it, we talked about all the buildings that were there, but we really didn't talk about uh, the, the over the, 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 this building that is shown on there, which is in, in white. So Larry, why don't you show our proposed building, which is on this? Yeah, so it, it, this, this actually shows the majority of our, our total site. Um, and, and in fact, down here at the very bottom is, is the Ipswich River. And if I'm not mistaken, um, 
uh, because we, we do have this little standalone piece of our site. I think that, the, if I'm not mistaken, Peter, the river uh, really kind of flows across the corner back in here. Um, but now, now you can see better what, what the connection is. So we have the public services yeah. building on the left. Right. And uh, <clears throat> the existing garage back here, this okay. is our plateau. Um, the, the, this uh, area is different from the earlier sketch, but, um, but the building is generally the same. So our, our proposed building we have, have the new, new driveway, which is fairly close to the existing um, entry location. Okay. But it so, does come down the hill. We, we essentially come through where the existing four car garage is down to the bottom uh, to this plateau level and have all of our parking under our building. Um, all of the resident parking under the building. We do have visitor and, and uh, some of the commercial spaces up at the front uh, at the upper level. But then this essentially from this point and this whole green area back in here is all level, uh, exist, essentially the existing level area. Uh, and, and it's essentially also empty. Um, there is some vegetation uh, through here, but the majority of this area is actually empty right now. Larry, when you say it's it's plateaued, is that the topography as it exists now, or is that yeah. after it's been developed? Uh, both. Uh, we're we're essentially leaving it, a, you know, within a foot or thereabouts. We, we I, I don't know if we're raising it up a little bit, or I, I doubt that we're dropping it. Actually, um, is that it's we, it it is right now a, a just a big flat turnaround area essentially for commercial. Um, it's, a, it's actually a parking area and it's a, it's, it's a, uh, significantly above the wetland. Uh, it's yes. a plateau that's significantly above the wetland. Okay. So in this picture that you're showing, the, um, the T, I guess, the sideways T, that would be all of the units? Yes. And in, in, is this proposal for apartment units, condominium units, um, townhouses? What exactly are these units? So we, this is a uh, two and a half story um, flat style units. And um, this, this is the, the main floor, the main and second floor are essentially the same. And then the third floor is um, kind of mixed. It'll be model, um, modeled a bit um, in, in the roof line. So we're, we actually, from the road, we really have what's essentially a two and a half story building visible. Um, and and it, I'm gonna just uh, shift my, so let's see. Madam Chair, it's, it's actually gonna be condos? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. And Madam Chair, just to your point before, the rendering that you looked at, uh, really is a view from the top left hand of this drawing, uh, looking at the buildings, um, looking back down. So you're right. seeing the L shape from the top half of the buildings, but not the, not the lower part or the, the rear part. Okay. Yes. Essentially, it doesn't I'm, show the whole thing in other words. Yeah. And I, I don't right. know that there's any, I don't know, there may be a spot from a quarter mile down to the east that you might be able to look through some trees in the winter and see part of the building, but otherwise you really won't see the the back half of the building. Um, it's it's it, it just is from the road. You have a lot of a lot of other buildings that along the street front that will obscure it completely. And in fact, you really won't see much even of of this this eastern side of the building. I think if you're a neighbor, that's not true. You will see that, but the but as a driving by, it's it's not a uh, it's not a very apparent building. And, uh, how many parking spaces underneath are you proposing? Uh, well, we're we're expecting uh, two per uh, unit. So we're uh, right now. I, I I think I have ninety in there right now, but. Uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'll figure out a way to get my other 10 for the 50 units. And, and as far as, you know, visitors coming, you know, what, what how many outside? Uh, let's see, we can count them real quick here. I think we have about 18 out in the uh, front at the moment. We have, probably have room for a few more than that. For the, uh, for the board's reference, uh, the, the bylaw, the proposed bylaw has 1.75 parking spaces per dwelling unit. I just want to make sure you're aware of that. It's, it's a minimum criteria, right? Yes, sir. Just for perspective, when I'm looking at the drawing and then I'm looking at this, what angle am I looking at the drawing from? Well, I'm essentially your, where my hand is in the plan here. Um, I'm, we're looking, the, the kind of the, the, the view is this, this triangle. So we're looking straight into the courtyard. Um, and in effect, standing here, looking right, right at the juncture of the, the L. Uh, so it's kind of split the difference to the two sides. So if that, if that helps. Yeah. It only shows kind of the front half of the proposed development. Yeah. And that's all you'll ever see from the road. It's, it's not possible to see the back area. But so of, of putting a hundred, there's, that'll be a lot more traffic in and out of that location onto Park Street in that area with all the, all the, um, all the parking there. A hundred, you said 90 or a hundred? Yeah, it's, it's, and, and I know, I think are um, the, 90 covers our, our units at 50, um, but we, we likely will have more. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, uh, the real traffic is, is essentially the one, 1 1.75 is actually the, uh, the number that would be relevant to the um, you know, actual traffic use. Is, is there going to be any access on the east side of the property, east side of the buildings to get back onto Park Street? I see the one entrance no. in the, the picture. No, there's here. not. There's no, no. We, we did talk with the fire department about having a, uh, that be uh, a solid place where they could access for in the event of a fire, but it's not designed to be a, uh, a part of the circulation on site. Uh, as it relates to the traffic, uh, the, the advantage of a, a, an over 55 project is uh, that you have a diverse population. They don't all go to work in the morning. And I know everybody doesn't do that now, but we hope we're going to get back to that before too long. Uh, the the uh, traffic is distributed throughout the day. And then also you have people that spend uh, time away, either people that go south for the winter or people that, that uh, travel. And so it doesn't generate, uh, the units don't generate uh, trip ends like uh, a single family home does. We'll be providing some of those numbers for the town meeting presentation, but uh, it's a big advantage to have the, the uh, over 55. So have you done the traffic studies yet? We did not do a traffic generation study for this. We only did the safety analysis so far, but, but we will be doing it. Well, in advance of the town meeting, I, I assume. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. We've been we've been talking about all the housing, and that's been the main focus in this. But the overlay also talks about you know mixed use, meaning commercial development of some sort. Can somebody please describe what you're thinking in that regard? Yeah. So at this point, um, the. McLean building out front is Mr. Wheeler's office and his intention is just to continue to use that for office space. And right now that's, that's what we're talking about for mixed use because they are going to be located within the same development. No other plans within the development itself. No, not at the moment. Any intent to? Is there any intent to in the future? I mean, you're, you, okay, you're saying not at the moment, but in the future, are you planning to? Bruce, do you want to, um, do you have any intention? 
No, we, 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 we don't have, um, uh, for the foreseeable future, we're going to use that, that uh, the McLean House as our office. We don't have a plan to, uh, to use it differently um, uh, in, in any near-term thoughts. But what's the use currently, Attorney Latham? It's, I'm sorry, it's, it's Bruce's office currently. No, but what's the use of the parcel currently under our zoning? Um, basically, it's uh, residential and uh, downtown. It's basically the downtown business. It's in the, uh, let me see. Well, the current, the current use is an automotive use and a, uh, and a, uh, a steel supply thing. They supply uh, metal decking. I don't think that their uses, I think their uses that were grandfathered, I don't think their uses that are consistent right. with the current zoning. Right. It's, it's in the local business district. So Lou's used to be down on the corner where the gas station is, and then he moved up to that, that long garage building. So he's located there. And then the steel um, business is behind him, as I understand it. And then Bruce is obviously in the historic house out front. Yeah, I think just Mr. Walner, it it contemplates retail, consumer, office. If CPC says it, it's compatible, which it doesn't have to be tied. We're tying it to Mr. Wheeler because he owns this parcel for which the overlay is being proposed. But if Mr. Wheeler sells it, whoever purchases it could do something differently to, you know, in accordance with the overlay zoning. Right. Does, the, any, uh, does any, do any of the other, I'm sorry, Attorney Latham, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, sorry. I, I, I was trying to respond, but I couldn't press the uh, unmute fast enough. Um, so um, we put the mixed use in not only to address Mr. Wheeler's current use of the, of the historic um, structure, uh, for offices, but also because we saw in the bylaws, uh, I'm sorry, in the master uh, plan that the, there was a promotion looking for mixed use. So we, we basically put it in there. Okay. Do, and does anyone else have any questions? Seeing none, Attorney Latham, do you have, is there anything else you wanted us to be aware of or? of your team, anything else that you wanted to present? I do not, but gentlemen, do you have any uh, anything else you want to mention to the board? All right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have another meeting with the CPC on the second, um, and uh, we'll be continuing to communicate with the Historic District Commission uh, as well on revising the architectural city plans. And we're also um, scheduled to go back to the FINECOM on March 10th. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you. Thanks for um, coming before us and giving the presentation. And I'm sure if we have more questions and follow up that we can communicate those to you through the, through the TA. Hey, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you. all your time on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Thank you. All right. The inevitable has arrived. Our next uh, order of business is the trash heap. <laughs> trash. Didn't trash. we go through, Madam Chair, didn't we go through this presentation or am I thinking of something different? We At our the last meeting? We, we talked about it, but then we had asked if, they, if we could hear some figures and projections. Oh, I don't know okay. if you recall that, but we, we had asked for some projections in terms of a graduated increase in the fee versus a, you know, a sig all significant once, okay. all at once. I'm pretty sure that's where we left it. That's right. So, and we have Mr. Deming who's joining us. Thank you for staying awake, Mr. Deming. <laughs> and um, I think, I guess, Mr. Gilbert, is there anything else that Anything yep. else on? Mr. Uh, Clark, the water superintendent, who also helps with uh, our uh, solid waste program is on, and the finance director, Liz Rourke, is also here. 
Um, we have uh, just a couple of slides that I think um, should have you should have seen in your meeting packet for this evening that did, were, I guess, the first attempt to give um, some some options for the board to look at. Um, I don't think we had any designs on there being a, a vote or a formal vote um, with regard to this uh, this evening, but that certainly can get pointed in the right direction, I think. Um, okay. Thanks, Mark. I was getting a little dizzy there. <laughs> um, so I'll share my screen if that's okay. Chris, oh, unless you want to. Yes. I, I don't mind sharing. Yeah, why don't you go ahead then? Oh, Mar Mark Clark's with us too. So as we discussed two weeks ago, I just wanted to go a uh, little recap on what we had talked about. Uh, this is a little history on the fees that have been associated with the trash collection in town going back to uh, 2003 when we had the sticker program. Everybody remembers going to stop and shop on Sunday night or Monday night trying to get your stickers before the trash came the next day. And then we had switched to uh, a quarterly and annually fee. Um, for, for six years, it was $45 a quarter, and then it had gone up for another eight years to $56 a quarter. And then in FY19, the most recent time that it had gone up, it was raised to $68 a quarter for trash and recycling. This is just a little breakdown of, of our um, billing summary, um, kind of breaking down the, the different units that we have. Uh, as you can see um, down at the bottom, the, the total number of units that we're receiving revenue from is 4,363. There are also a few exemptions in there, uh, alternate haulers, but uh, that total number comes out, like I said, to 4,363. So as you know, last time we had talked, we've gone in depth a little bit more about um, the future of the JRM contract. Uh, where it currently stands and where it looks to go. Um, as you may remember, uh, they proposed for FY22 a 0% increase, 3% uh, for a year FY23, another 3% for FY24, and then 3.5% three, <clears throat> for FY25 and FY26. The current disposal contract that we're in with Covanta um, shows a pretty significant increase. This is, like I said, a contract that we're already in uh, for FY22 that the tipping fees had gone up uh, just a little bit more than 20%. Uh, the only thing that you, everybody should remember is that with this aspect of trash and recycling, I'm sorry, with just trash, not recycling, is that this number can vary on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis based on the actual amount of tonnage that the town is disposing of. So this brings us to where we need to be for the fees. Um, what we had kind of looked at was three major options. Um, one of them, um, option A, was basically designed to keep the stabilization fund as, as level funded as it is now. Um, that kind of entailed bringing up uh, a decent percentage in the first year and then Kind of leveling it out and having a small increase every year going forward. Uh, option two was a um, pretty significant uh, increase in FY22, but would leave uh, zero percent raises for the next five years after that. Uh, as you can see, that would kind of front load the stabilization fund to try to take care of the added fees later on in, in this big contract. And then option C. Was, was kind of more of a level funded across the board. As you can see, it was a 6.1% increase every year for the next five years. Uh, the, the issue that, that we see with that is, as you can see an FY24 stabilization fund would, would drop pretty low. Um, but you know, we, we put together three different options um, that we think uh, is kind of the way to go forward dealing with the fees. Okay. Comments, questions? Madam Chair. Mr. Gilbardo. Through you, I mean, we did have some conversation about trying to, to break out 
some component of this that, you know, for example, the municipal and school charges um, as something that could be perhaps borne by the general fund budget. And I, I think that the feeling was, you know, it's just very difficult for us to figure out what that cost actually is because the tonnage is all rolled into our, um, our regular expenses. Um, so it's kind of a, a difficult expense, as I understand it from Chris, for us to be able to adequately project and the other, you know, point that we just will bring up is, you know, if you, you know, a, a simple review of the budget and the revenue plan over the past few years, you see that there's been some level of subsidy that's occurred, um, depending upon what our receipts are, particularly in those years where, um, you know, where we didn't adjust the rate, but the, uh, the cost went up. But we thought that this kind of put something on paper for us to start the discussion in fairly short order um, regarding what the alternatives could look like. Um, you know, my, my preference had been to not see the um, solid waste stabilization fund drop below um, below $100,000. Um, it's kind of tricky to do that because of the amount of subsidy that's required in, in, in year one. And if you want to keep the rate from bouncing all over the place, you, you got to spread it out. So I, I think the closest example to that is probably option C. But I think Chris and I both are concerned that, you know, we have one bad year and only having $40,000 or less than $40,000 in that stabilization fund might put us in a challenging spot. Um, option B, you know, we're, we're definitely, you know, cognizant of the impact that that will have, um, particularly for those who have been um, directly impacted by the economic um, situation that is, is going on here in the, in the country. So. You know, I, I, we, we obviously have our concerns about that. And then, you know, when you sort of just look at us adjusting the rate to reflect the cost and relying on that, that um, keeping the stabilization fund level, you see that in option A um, as a sort of the, the purest, adjust the rate to reflect the cost period, you know? So anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, any thoughts to Mr. Studo? Um, just seeing this, I mean, based on what the TA just said and just, I mean, to try to balance the minimizing impact, I mean, I think option A looks like the clear best option to me. I mean, it keeps the stabilization fund pretty level. So you don't have to worry about that scenario where in 2024 something happens and we only have, you know, the price of, uh, you know, Honda Accord as a backup. So... Uh, you know, and also, I mean, that that first hit of 13.4 seems high, but after that, it levels off. And also, most importantly, by 2020 and 2026, you know, we still have it that we've gradually gotten to a number where it could be more realistic, especially, um, you know, after hearing a couple of presentations and also what Mrs. Gonzalez and she's brought back from the recycling committee, it seems like it is inevitable here that unless there's a 180 pulled by China, these numbers are just going to keep getting worse from an expense standpoint. So, you know, that's, I mean, I, I think option A based on that is the best way to go. Thanks, Mr. Strudel. Any other comments, questions, discussion? And again, what was the, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, the, um, and again, Mr. Gilberto, I don't know who's been involved in the discussions here, but as far as uh, um, general fund contributions to the tune of, you know, $30,000, $35,000, $40,000 a year, whatever it's going to be, $50,000 a year, uh, the overriding concern is what? So, um, I, I don't. I don't know that it was necessarily a concern. I mean, I think the first thing we want to highlight is that in, in there are years past when the revenues have not met the expense. I mean, I think just recognizing that is probably the first part of the conversation. Well, think, we, which years when we didn't we didn't use the stabilization fund to to offset that to cover it? I don't believe so, and I know the finance director's on here. She could probably speak more directly to the to the the, the issue and the way that it played out. But you know, we've had some again. It may be small, but we've had some resultant subsidy that's occurred just by virtue of the collections versus the expense. That, that's just what transfer some free cash in there to uh, to cover cover the cost and, and maintain the stabilization fund. I mean, because uh, we never ran we we haven't run the stabilization fund down to zero. 
That's no, sure. no. As a matter of fact, we've, been, we've only been transferring money in, I, I believe, in, in recent right. years. Right. So, so to, to, to me, uh, part of the reason for the stabilization fund is just to, to assist in the, in the fluctuations. And again, if you're going to be doing it on an annual basis, you can't, you can't do that. You would run it dry. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm asking is, you know, what would be our tolerance level to assist in what this modeling is showing us? I mean, I'm looking at the, the annual costs a uh, couple of slides back. You know, you're, you're talking about things remaining the same for fiscal year 21, 22, and then a $25,000 jump, then another $30,000, $25,000 jump, and then it jumps precipitously a little bit more. $30,000, and then another $30,000 on top of that, the fiscal year 26. So if you look at the stabilized things, you know, you need a, a $30,000, $35,000 subsidy from the general fund on an annual basis in order to to level things out a little bit more and i'm not saying that we shouldn't raise the rates a bit but uh you know again we don't know what's going to happen in the marketplace uh, what's impacting the cost you know five years out from now but it's uh i think we just have to get used to the the fact that at some point and again maybe with some people don't believe we're there yet but at some point, we're going to have to um, assist by subsidizing this budget, I believe. You know, so it's uh, because otherwise it just gets out of hand and uh, it again adversely impacts the lower users more than the bigger users, and so on and so forth. And if we're and if we're not going to go to a, on a graduated basis as far as you know, pay to throw, um, to me people need to be able to feel as though, you know, the tax dollars are going towards a portion of this again, putting it back in again. I, I was around when we, when we had the stickers when we implemented it and it wasn't, it was 60 cents at the time, I think. Um, wasn't popular, but again, it was a pay as you throw. And if you put out three bags, you use three stickers, you can use one bag, you put out one sticker. Um, but then when we went to the, the flat fee and everybody pays the same, you know, some people are disproportionately being hit. But now this is everybody. I mean, because of what the marketplace is and what's happening, what our costs are increasing, you know, maybe the time has come where we should just um, assist with general revenues to some degree. Okay. Mr. O'Leary, um, the finance director has her hand up. So I okay. think, you know, she does want to contribute to the discussion. So I'm, I'm going to recognize Ms. Rock. You're muted. Oh, I'm going to have to call in, Liz. <laughs> um, Mr. Deming, can you go back to this slides before that while we're waiting for Liz? So... Yeah. The, the, the one the one before is what uh, I was referring to. That one there, yeah. In you know, five years, you, you've got over a $100,000 increase. If I could add my two cents and just... Um, oh, Mr. Gonzalez. You know, that it was a comparison done with um, other towns. Um. Mr. Clark did, did some comparable ones around here. I did some myself. And I mean, what we found was we're still not paying what other people are paying. I mean, there's people paying every other week. They're not even getting picked up every week what these prices are here. Um, and we're getting picked up every week. And our... Uh, recyclables are included in that and they're paying separately for their recyclables. So we really are paying a lot less than most communities are paying. So I just, I mean, I know that it stinks that it's going to go up, but it's going up everywhere and we are still very affordable in our, in our trash prices. So, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like we need to subsidize. Okay. 
Ms. Rock, can we hear from you? Hear me now? Yeah, we go. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So, so just to go back to um, Select Board O'Leary's uh, point about the general fund or the tax rate or the taxpayers absorbing part of the sanitation budget. There um, annually is a piece of it that does get absorbed through the, the operating budget, um, which we'll see you know, momentarily when we review the revenue plan. On the revenue plan, we only, um, you know, for FY21, have a budgeted revenue amount that we expect to bring in of um, $1,185,000. And the sanitation budget, as you can see on a previous slide, uh, is larger than $1.1, million. And uh, I believe it was two years ago or three years ago, you know, there was a discussion that was had amongst the financial planning team when the sanitation budget grew to um, over 1.2 million. And that was for the municipal's uh, side budget allocation to absorb the additional costs of the sanitation budget within our operating budget. So the trash fee does not 100% cover the sanitation budget. Yes, some years um, we are able to take remaining funds out of the sanitation budget uh, that are unspent and transfer those to the sanitation stabilization fund. The past two years, it's only been $30,000 each year. We have not drawn on that fund in the past two years either. However, I just wanna note that the trash fee, even with the increase a few years back, does not fully cover the sanitation um, approved operating budget. Uh, so I want just to make that known that it had the, the municipal's revenue allocation has been absorbing the difference between what we collect in the trash fee and what is approved for the sanitation operating budget. Thank you, Ms. Rock. Yes, thank you. This is Harold Butt. You're muted. Um, yeah, uh, so I think it was in today or yesterday's Globe, there's a community, I believe on the North Shore, that has made uh, recycling of uh, foodstuffs, for lack of a better term, mandatory. Hamilton. And, okay, and they received, it, they received a grant uh, from the state of the feds to help uh, purchase uh, uh, trash cans, for lack of a better term, into which you could put your the stuff that you would normally put in your compost pile. And it is picked up by a compost company. What it does is it takes the, the bad head of lettuce and the carrots that are sprouting and the uneaten winter squash that nobody wanted more than one helping of and takes them out of the trash stream and puts them to some reasonable use, read composting. Um, it, it's something that I'm somewhat aware of because uh, my daughter who lives in the Bay Area, uh, they have three trash barrels. Uh -huh. and, and trust me, if you put your old newspaper in the green barrel, you're dead in the water. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I understand that uh, it's a little bit late to do it for this upcoming contract, but I do think it's something that the town should seriously look at. But it, Hamilton, I believe, did it for a number of years and it wasn't compulsory. And it was only this past year that they've made it compulsory. Uh, but as, if, you, if you keep some of those kinds of items out of the trash cycle, then you decrease your tipping fees. And that's a large part of what's driving the increased costs of trash. So I think it's something we should think about. I don't think it's something we can do about tonight or maybe not even this year, but I think we should certainly consider it as a possibility. There are residents in town that subscribe to a similar individual service where their stuff gets picked up by a composting company of some sort. Um, 
and and I think that, and I believe that they may get some, uh, you know, well-aged compost back for their garden. I don't know exactly, but uh, I think it's a worthwhile thing to look into and to think about going forward. And it would certainly help decrease some of our costs. Okay. Not what I was expecting you to contribute, but thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's all right. Uh, okay. Any other comments, questions? Um, Mad Madam Chair, I think Mr. Uh, Buckley has his hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Hello, Mrs. Menapelli. Hello, yes. everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> Welcome. Well. Thank, you. Thank you. So I guess I'm here more as a member of the finance planning team. I think I, think I still have some post-traumatic stress from that, that discussion that Liz mentioned a few years ago. Um, with the trash fee in those meetings. But um, I just wanted to say a few things. I mean, I think, I think number one, I appreciate the work here. Honestly, you know, hearing about trash in the news and then seeing the proposed proposal here actually seems very reasonable. I mean, I actually think in North Reading, we have a pretty fair rate for trash. Um, to Mr. O'Leary's point, I think, I, I disagree with subsidizing and I think, I think it is a fee that should be paid. But I also think that if there's changes, like again, if my family uses more and, and they're, you know, the board sees fit to say that, you know, you can pay for one can or two cans or three cans and and there's more for somebody that's using more, I would be in support of that too. You know, if, if somebody's using more, I hear that. But I I, I personally think it should not be subsidized generally. Um, I think that as the fees increase, they should be increased. The only thing I wanted to point out was just from the options that you had up there. I agree that option A is probably the best. My, my concern, people point out with option, option C, the stabilization fund goes way down. Option B, I think the biggest problem is you end up in FY 2026 with only 8150. The other two have 88 and 91. And I just worry about, you know, if you, if you do that with option B, you're only at 81.50 in 2026 and you have a cliff in 2027. And so I don't think that adequately does it either. So I, I think option A is a fair point. There's an increase, there's a little bit of an increase this year because there hasn't been an increase in years past. And personally, I think that, you know, with a fee that goes up every year, I think it needs to be adjusted more frequently. And so I think the reason there will be a jump this year is because there hasn't been a jump in, in the last few years. And so I think it needs to be adjusted and then it should be, you know, adjusted every year as, as the expense goes up, but just my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Any other comments, questions, Mrs. Hurlbut? Muted. We're still muted. Uh, I keep getting muted and unmuted. I've lost all self-control of the mute. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question, I, I guess for Chris and the town administrator. Um, we have a, a contract for the next year, if I'm not correct, with our current haulers, for lack of a better term. And yet this um, forecasts a budget out through 2026. Uh, I'm not quite sure that there's any guarantee that uh, the rate might not go up even faster than that. Um, I think that this, this, this current year, um, not necessarily contract year, but this year of COVID, there, uh, there's been a greater amount of trash going into the trash stream than before because there are more people at home and they're not putting it in the dumpster at work. Uh, so I, I am, I'm a little bit concerned about spending the stability fund, given that we really only have a one or two year contract um, and that it's pretty hard to tell exactly where this is gonna go. I'll take my answer off the air. Well, the, the, the yeah. proposed JRM contract is a multi-year deal that will take us through fiscal year 2026 with reasonably fixed costs um, the and Chris, can you go back one slide to the um, the uh, tonnage? No, yeah, there it is. 
So, you know, th those are also under contract. I think, I think Chris, that's the last year we were under contract, FY26, right? For, for Covanter, it's FY24. The, 24, the, okay. The, so, so we've got a couple of years. Those last two years are, are on there with an assumption on it. Th those are areas where there could be, a, you know, certainly a spike that could happen. But we, we do have a few years of, of projections that we're working off of for this. I think the variable to your point is the tonnage. I mean, we've seen high usage in the tonnage, and you know, it's possible that that could come down in the next few years to our benefit, obviously. Okay, thanks, Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Demi. Just to comment on Abby's question is, uh, Abby, the current Covanta contract, as you can see on this slide, is, is FY21 to FY24. And the JRM contract uh, that we're currently in expires at the end of FY21. So we've been negotiating for an, a five-year deal for FY22 to FY20. <laughs> so that contract uh, for JRM is expiring this year. Thanks, Mr. Demi. So the 2022 to 2026 annual cost is what this slide is showing us. Correct. So we're going to start out 2022 under the contract at the same cost, but and then it starts to jump incrementally. But there's a pretty significant jump from 25 to 26. It's, yeah, so they, they caught up with what they are, you know, they caught up with year 2022 and year 2026, basically. The, the big thing to keep in mind for the big jump in FY22 on the final slide is if I go back one is, sorry, um, is to the increase in Covanta's increase mm -hmm. in FY 22. So the JRM, we don't, we, the proposal is not that they'll go up in FY 22, but Covanta is going up significantly in FY 22, which is why we need to make an adjustment for FY 22's rates, not based on JRM, but Covanta. All right. Okay. Any other comments? I don't think it's set for a vote this evening. It's not, Madam Chair. And you know, one suggestion that I, I might offer is maybe, maybe we can try to um, ease, see if we can do something to ease that jump in year one, relying on the stabilization fund, and see if there's any, if there's some other way to spread that cost out without draining it to the extent that it would be drained in year three. I think it is um, on the slide. Yes, thank you, Chris. You know, I think, you know, you hear of this and we did get a letter. I did get a letter from a resident about, you know, and Mr. Buckley just mentioned it, you know, well, if, you know, I see the neighbor puts a lot more in, what are we going to do about those people? And it's unfair. I have one bag. And that's really, you know, I don't know if there's been any kind of success with any other community that you've looked at in terms of, you know, handling that where does a does a household that generates a smaller amount of trash maybe only one barrel versus the household that generates the two barrels you know and we're also we're also limited already we're limiting the amount of trash a household can throw out already um, even with the fee being paid so is there a way to do that successfully have other communities done that successfully and what is that you know okay you can have one small barrel and we'll charge you half the fee. You know, uh, what, what, it, what is the, and then the one household that has two big barrels and fills them to the brim, you're gonna pay twice the fee. Has there been any success that you're aware of with other communities handling it in that way? So, I mean, what, what I have seen that's often connected to a, you know, municipally issued toter so, you know, one toter versus two or a large versus a small toter. We're not proposing getting into the toter business at this point in time. I don't have a whole lot of familiarity with something outside of that other than the pay as you throw program, which I think we've all summarily dismissed at this point. <laughs> uh, Chris or Mark, I don't know if you've seen either of those, either of the, have you, have you seen either example? No, I would, I would agree with what you said, either a pay as you throw or the toters, which I think we've both tried to get away from both of those options at this time. And again, I, I looked at 
a town that's private, but you know, there are people who just get their trash picked up every other week because they only have minimal trash and they're still paying every other week what we're paying every week. So, I mean, I know you, you think, oh, it's not fair, but we're still paying less money than they are. So, I mean, if it makes anybody feel any better. I guess mine is along the same lines as, as Mr. O'Leary's in that it's a, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a pretty significant jump for some households to pay that. So that that's, I think I'm, I'm struggling with that, especially given the year, the year that we've been through the difficult year that we've been through with so many of our, the families have been hit financially. So I guess I'm thinking of it like that. How can we sort of buffer the, buffer the increase that we know is inevitable? Madam okay, Chair. we have two hands up now, three hands up now. We'll go to, let's go to Mr. Studo first. So I have a question relative to some, what other costs went up? And, and again, I'm just looking at, let's, let's look at FY 2022, which is the biggest jump. Um, it's, it's total about $34. And again, I'm not trying to minimize the increased cost, but relative to every other cost of living adjustment in North Reading, like, do we weigh that as well? And the reason I say is because from property taxes to um, just general inflation and cost of living, I, I, I'm just trying to see, uh, you know, is it, it maybe just because I'm looking at it differently, but is there that much of an impact of a $34 increase annually for this, for next year? And that's the big jump, right? And again, I'm, I'm asking a question um, not to try to minimize that any increase will, you know, could be a burden, but just to put it relative to, you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of dollars of general cost of living increases that we can't control. So meaning that should we be focusing on something else rather than the $34 that this is going to go up annually next year? That's just a general question to anyone who wants to give an opinion. I'm just trying to get feedback. Because that's what the total is for the year. I must have been doing my numbers wrong then. Well, if it's $68 right now a quarter and we go to 77 Uh, yeah, I mean. Okay, thanks, Mr. Studo. <laughs> so on to Mr. Gilberto. I, I was only going to add that you know one thing that we can try to do. Can can folks hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I was just going to suggest that we could try to look at utilizing stabilization funds in year one, and then sort of flattening it out over the couple of years and. Give, give maybe a, a fourth option to look at that maybe will address that the level of the increase. Um, you know, if the board wants us to look at doing that while going into the the the, um, the operating budget and, and the tax rate. We certainly can look at it in that fashion. But I, I think at least a, a good next step might be to just add an option that rather than does something as uniform as we're, we're looking at here, maybe tries to stagger it a bit, utilize utilizing stabilization funds not draining it, but utilizing them in year one to try to buffer that increase to the extent that we can. I mean, that's an option we can look at the board wants us to. Okay, let's and have- the, the, only, the only problem with that is, is it's a, it's a one-time cash infusion that you have to make up the difference later on. You know, unless you're gonna sustain it, sustain mm -hmm. the infusion, it, it's a one, right? It's a one-time cash infusion and then you have to make it up in, la in later years anyway. Uh, so. Yes, like prolonging the inevitable. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Hurlman, since you have the last word on this, and then I guess we're going to have to revisit it for a vote at some point. We're just no. kicking the, kicking the trash can down the alley, I guess. <laughs> Mrs. Hurlman, you have the last word. A couple of years ago, I believe we instituted uh, with our contract with JRM uh, two barrels per household per week. I don't really think that's policed very well. I think you can drive by, drive around town on trash day and uh, many houses have way more than two barrels. Some have two, 
Some have won, some have none, but there seems to be um, enough houses that have an, way beyond what's supposed to be picked up. Initially, when this program started of two barrels per week, I believe the JRM was not going to pick up anything over that amount. I'm not, it's not clear to me that JRM isn't picking up everything. And it seems to me that if we are putting that much more into the trash cycle, and uh, then we are also paying an increased tipping fee, and it could be less. Now, it may even out, but the bottom line is I think there are uh, people that are being piggy and taking up far more sidewalk space in front of their house with trash than uh, supposedly is, is permitted. And I think it would be unrealistic to expect JRM necessarily to completely police this. And I'm not sure what you do about it. Mike, have you noticed any of that? The, con the haulers, and I, I've had this conversation with Mr. Deming, Mr. Clark and Mrs. Gonzalez, they will, they will restrict it as much as you tell them to and they will caution you about putting those restrictions in place and the impact and what it will result in for complaints. You know, um, I, I had a conversation with the public works administrative staff today about, you know, we, we do have an option for uh, a call in, so to speak. If you're cleaning out your basement, you can call in, basically give them a day's notice and JRM will put you on the watch list for collections. So, you know, are we more flexible than, you know, some communities might be, especially those that have toters? Yeah, I, I think that we are. Um, is it better than where it was in 2012 and 13? Yes, it is. Um, so, you know, it, it's a balance. It, I, I can't describe it in any other way. And it's all skewed right now by the work people are doing on their homes and the cleaning up that's been happening over the past year as well, as we all know. Um, but what would I, would, would I say, I mean, have I noticed that it, or been told that there's some egregious violation that's, in, that's happening townwide? No. I think most people are following the guidelines within reason. It's the within reason that. And look, I, I was in, in a community that we, it was like, you couldn't even have the top of the toter open. It had to be totally shut. Yeah, and no, we were warned no. against enacting that rule and what it would mean. And they were right when they warned us. I realize that it's it's a difficult situation, but it does seem to me that we that there are enough people that are throwing out a whole lot more than they perhaps should be. But what do I know? You know a lot. All right. Well, we have we're gonna have to <laughs> we're gonna have to make a decision at some point, but we also do have to move along because we have other business, and I I'm hoping we can get this wrapped up before another midnight meeting. So thank you, Mr. Deming for joining us. And thank you, Mr. Clark too. And we no, have to go through you. our, we have to, we have to go through our revenue plan with the, um, the finance director too. So let's move on to the next order of business. Thank you. See you later, Mr. Hi, Mark. Bye, Chris. Thanks guys. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I, Mr. Gilbert, I was just going to move right into, I know that uh, we had a, we were given uh, the documentation in the share folder. So I was just going to move on, right to invite Ms. Rourke to speak on the revenue plan, if that's all right. Certainly. Revenue and expense, expense plan 2022. Yes. Um, may I share my screen? I just um, yeah. did a quick PowerPoint so that you don't strain your eyes, even though you still will strain your eyes on seeing some of the numbers because they're quite small. <laughs> so hold on a moment. Okay. Uh, let's see. See, thank God. I thought that said 18 slides because I can't see now. And it's just <laughs> no, ten. no, and they're just quick. Ten, including the cover page. So yes, they're they're very quick. It's so um, you already have seen, you know, the revenue plan that's in your packet, and that was last reviewed with the financial planning team um, on or about February 5th, I believe. Um, so we'll just quickly go through this. 
this is just um, what the financial planning team is and who we are and, and what we do annually. So it's made up of the town administrator, myself, two members of um, the select board, the chair and vice chair and the chair and vice chair of the finance committee, the chair and vice chair of the school committee, as well as the superintendent of schools and the school uh, business manager or assistant superintendent of finance and operations. Um, and what we do is we meet uh, regularly, monthly, sometimes even twice a month, uh, especially as we progress throughout the budget process in the fiscal year to review uh, revenues to date, to review uh, the local aid that we are hearing we will receive as a community at the state level, um, as well as new growth figures, uh, and fixed costs and other expenditures that uh, the town has. So we'll quickly um, go through that. I just wanted to give a brief overview to let everybody know what the financial planning team is and what we do. So we begin um, each fiscal year. Um, typically, you know, we'll start meeting August, but nothing really has developed then. And, and really when the first uh, initial draft of the revenue plan is developed is around November and then it progresses from there. So we continue to have ongoing discussions with the financial planning team. We meet monthly and we continue to adjust the revenue plan as we work through the budget process. So one of the items that, you know, will need to be adjusted will be the trash fee that will offset the municipal's uh, sides revenue, which we will see. So that, that's one item that will continue to be adjusted. Another item that continues to you know, wait in the wings and we typically don't hear about until the end of February is what our health insurance increases. So you know, there's, there's things that we wait on um, throughout the budget process that, that don't come right away. So just a quick snapshot um, from FY21 to FY22, um, the tax levy, uh, FY21 is all actual and, or I should say to, to be actual, you know, new growth is actual, the tax levy is actual, the debt exclusion is actual. Uh, unrestricted in chapter 70, uh, you know, those are, what the final uh, state's budget was for state aid and local aid to the town. Um, you know, give or take, those should be actual. Um, this is a old um, MSBA, former SBA B reimbursement that we receive, local receipts and other financing sources. And we'll go see, um, and on the next few slides, what actually local receipts are, you know, motor vehicle excise, license and permits, meals tax, those type of things. So this is our um, estimated local receipt figure after we set the tax rate. So, you know, we went to town meeting with a higher number. This is the amount adjusted after we set the tax rate. Other financing sources would be, for example, a transfer from the debt capital stabilization fund or the solid waste stabilization fund to offset those operating budgets. We move forward to FY22. We have our adjusted tax levy that rolls forward from FY21. We have our estimated new growths and it's broken down by you know, regular new growth, which would be additions or remodels, complete teardowns. And then we have our new growth associated with uh, Pulte Homes, 104 Lowell Road. We have our debt exclusion, which is made up of um, various uh, items over the years that have been voted, you know, but mainly uh, it is for the high school, middle school project. A lot of our older projects um, have dropped off, but we still carry, say, you know, the police station is an example that was a debt exclusion. Um, then we go to our state aid figures of unrestricted in chapter 70. These are what we're hearing as of right now. This is an item that we always continue to watch. Um, until the final state's budget is approved. Local receipts, this is what we're estimating right now. And in a, the next slide, I will point out just, you know, two local receipts that we continue to discuss and watch uh, at financial planning. 
And other financing sources, as I mentioned, would be a transfer the, from the debt capital stabilization fund, um, the cell tower fund, those type of things. So, so the revenue plan, um, I just went over, you know, the top part um, briefly, you know, with our levy limit and new growth and broken out and our debt exclusion. I spoke uh, about the first two uh, line items for state aid, Chapter 70 and unrestricted. We also have smaller um, state aid items, veterans benefits, which is reimbursements for veterans benefits that we give out as a town um, that, you know, there's a look back period on that reimbursement from the state and, you know, other small items that we receive. So total state aid, Total, total taxes are listed on this sheet. I, I broke it out. You'll see local receipts and other financing sources on the next slide, just so that we could somewhat see the numbers. So as I mentioned under local receipts, we are continuing to watch motor vehicle excise and meals tax. Those are two areas that we you know, want to make sure that we would be able to achieve those revenue figures that we're estimating for FY22. And the motor vehicle excise largest commitment goes out annually um, around this time. And it's going out the 26th, I believe. Um, so that is our largest commitment. And then, you know, it's due within 30 days. And we'll know probably, you know, mid-April how much of that commitment we have collected how much we'll have to go on demand and warrant and so far from there. Um, you know, we hope that that is a realistic number for FY22. Uh, and like I said, we'll continue to watch it. Everything else we feel fairly confident with. You'll see that uh, investment income, how, how we've talked over the years, um, from investing the sale of town owned land from 104 Lowell Road uh, that CD value has dropped. We also have dropped what we include in our budget and the excess revenue that we achieve from that CD that we have the 15 million invested in, it goes and turns into free cash annually. And also interest rates are, are down dramatically, not so much for that CD, but for our other money market accounts and, and savings accounts. The other area is meals tax, and it's just kind of an unsure number. Um, you know, restaurants are, you know, getting business back. Things are picking up, and we hope it continues that way. So, you know, we're going to leave it at 230000 for now, um, but I just wanted to point out those are two areas that within financial planning we continue to discuss and, and monitor. And then we'll move it to other financing sources. And as I mentioned, sample finance, other financing sources would be the transfer from the debt service stabilization fund, which is transferred annually to offset the debt service budget. And that transfer cannot e exceed um, a non-exempt debt service. So that's why it's held at um, 1.2 million. Last year, we were able to um, get a little more out of it, um, but right now it's holding steady at 1.2 million. And then we just have a debt exclusion from years past on a batch on the bachelor elder school <clears throat> uh, bond premium that had to be amortized over the life of the bond. And again, that amount offsets the debt service budget. And then transfer from cell tower. We had a one time extra transfer last year of 250,000 in addition to our annual 300,000 um, from the cell tower account. And we cannot do that this year. Their balance is just not, not available. And the health insurance trust fund, that was the remaining balance in that fund. And that was due to um, Medicare part uh, B that we were receiving and now we no longer receive those reimbursements. So total general fund revenue for FY22 estimated is 72 million. Moving on to expenses, um, you'll see our fixed costs and then you'll see employee benefits details. 
and it's broken out by um, employee benefit detail is broken out by school and municipal costs. And you will see that right now we have um, under fixed costs, the capital improvement plan put in um, from raise and appropriate uh, for $250,000. Last year we had to pull that out and fund um, very few capital items and those items were funded with free cash due to you know the economic situation and the unknown um, for what was going to occur in FY21. You'll also see that the snow and ice deficit has been put back in. Um, the snow and ice deficit was taken out last year uh, and it was covered by, I believe a small amount, a small piece of it was covered by free cash last year. And it was not needed to be raised on, on the recap. And you also see that school and municipal retirements were pulled out last year and those were funded one time by free cash, but they are back in uh, this year for FY22. So one area that I wanna just point to is the PFA health insurance contingency. This amount of 1 million is listed there and it's assuming um, an increase to the health insurance budget of seven and a half percent. This is the offsetting piece for any new members that may not remember the offsetting piece that helps us reduce our health insurance budget and has been very successful over the past four years now, Mike, three years, um, three or four years, I think, you know, um, and it's been very, oh, yeah. very successful um, in achieving savings for the town as a, as a whole and have being giving us the ability to put away those savings in a stabilization fund for both the employee and the employer, meaning the town, um, so that when we are hit with a really bad increase year, we can then use some of those to stabilize the health insurance budget. Quickly moving down, um, you know, county retirement, it's an annual assessment. It's broken out um, by school and municipal workers comp, you know, annual costs, um, health insurance, as I mentioned, health insurance, we are carrying a seven and a half percent increase. And it is just about this time that we will be learning what our true increases from our uh, health insurance provider so that, you know, you'll be hearing about that within the very near future, I'm sure. And that really are the major, you know, drivers of the employee benefits um, budget. And I will quickly just show you um, the municipal allocation and the school allocation. Now these are, are, are fixed to where we were um, last or, or the current fiscal year. And so they've just rolled forward they may not be final percentages for both the municipal side and the school side. That's to be determined. And that's another piece of how we continue to have discussions, you know, at financial planning to go over how, how things are washing out and what the municipal's budget, you know, is uh, presented for FY22 and, you know, the town administrator's, you know, recommendation and then what the the school department's FY22 operating budget is and, and their recommendations. So this all gets, you know, uh, discussed and we come out with some resolution at the end and every single year we do. Um, so these are just there, uh, you know, don't take them to heart, don't take them written in stone, but the, these are our starting point. And, you know, one area that I was speaking of is the trash fee the 1,185. So the sanitation budget, if you looked back for FY21 is greater than 1.1 million or 1.2 million. So, and you can see that going forward for FY22, it's gonna be 1.3 million. So just to keep in mind that the municipal's revenue allocation was picking up part of the difference. All right. 
Um, and then just this was the budget distribution. So total general fund revenue, as I mentioned, you know, 72 million fixed costs, as we saw, which was the capital plan, the PFA contingency, um, the snow and ice, the retirements, those are the fixed costs. And then the employee benefits budget is um, the county retirement assessment, the health insurance, the Medicare, the workers comp, the general liability, those are the employee benefits budget. So the fixed costs are not, they're deducted right away from the revenue figure. They're not broken out amongst the municipal and school allocations. And then just quickly, major fixed cost drivers, uh, the fixed cost total, um, 11 million five approximately health insurance budget as I mentioned we budgeted seven and a half percent increase over FY 21 county retirement is a six and a half percent increase over FY 21 Medicare four percent increase over FY 21 workers comp insurance and general liability three percent increase over FY 21 snow and ice is just a hundred percent increase over FY 21 because we didn't fund it within raise and appropriate it was funded by free cash and then the regional school assessment is going up almost four percent over fy21 um, so those are just some of the major fixed costs and as we go through the budget process you know we'll have slides of some of the municipal major cost drivers within the operating budget so we we talk about you know some of we pull out some of the bigger cost drivers as we go through um, the budget process. That is all I have. Um, and you have the actual revenue plan so you can you know, review it. I will um, put this presentation in tonight's uh, meeting packet and share file as well. So you have this and you know, this is just a starting point. Um, it seems like you know, you may say, well, we're already at the end of February, but there's so many things that that change for us. So, you know, when we get to April, we're in a better, better position to really tell you what we're going to expect. Thank you, Ms. Frohr. Do I have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Uh, what about a reimbursement Probably for the right. COVID stuff? Where is that? going to be factored in uh, so or are you considering uh, it a wash you know are we are we speaking about um the cares act funds yes yep. yes so the cares act funds um sit in a grant fund and so they are not part of the general fund and the general fund expenses that have been incurred um due to COVID-19 have been moved and um, are offset against the funds that we receive from uh, reimbursement. So we submit reimbursement for the expenses that we've incurred. That's so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Some of those expenses, though, include uh, time spent by our administrators or yes. department heads, uh, which we have factored into the general budget anyway. Yes. Um, there's no additional compensation that we're putting out. So some of our compensation for uh, our salaries and things are being subsidized by the CARES Act, which would free up additional funds. That would be reflect reflected um, at, with surplus, um, you know, unspent uh, salary budgets at the end of FY21. And then that would roll into free cash. Right. Okay. But we're not, uh, so you're not throwing that into miscellaneous, not recurring, non recurring, or some other place? No, that's not uh, how we, I mean, we can amend the operating budget. And no, I'm just, just, just so we're actually getting a true picture as to, you know, what we're going to have for surplus in order to help plug the holes later on in the budgetary process. Um, again, the, the, hopefully the non recurring, I don't want this thing to, uh, be prolonged too much more. And again, there, there appears to be um, more federal money coming shortly, you know, particularly for states and cities and towns. So, uh, yes. so that, that certainly offsets part of our operating budget on both sides of the equation, including the school department. But 
Um, so therefore, it should free up some surplus cash moving forward into the next fiscal year, I would think. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't free up cash. It just generates free cash. And less. Well, that's right. It's, 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 it's poor terminology on my part, but it, it generates free cash. Uh, and again, and I understand the, the delay in that, but it's also something that we should be able to um, anticipate to a certain degree. And I just don't. I'm just looking to get a sense as to what what we think that's going to be. And I can give a report at either the next meeting or the following meeting, whichever agenda doesn't have, you know, we're not consumed with reviewing budgets, um, but I can tie that in as well to give you an idea of where we stand to date on, um, say, surplus salaries within the town administrator's budget, you know, um, how much has of this is just an example. It could be from the finance director's budget, how much we've moved to the CARES Act grant fund. I can, I can give you a, a listing of, of what expenses we have moved to the CARES Act grant fund, if that would be helpful. <clears throat> Keep in mind that um, <clears throat> from March to June of last year, that would be last fiscal year. So some of those expenses we've been, re we were reimbursed for all, all of those expenses that we you know, submitted for reimbursement and those were moved off to the grant fund and that generated free, re free cash for, for the town. Um, so then this, this batch would be from, from July to um, December. And yeah, that's good. I think it's important for us to kind of recognize that because it's not going to be recurring and it's not that our salaries of our employees and benefits are going to go down at all. So at right. some point, two years out, we're going to have to pick up those costs through a normal revenue stream. And I think we need to just be cognizant of that. Exactly. So it might be helpful just to put it on the, on the radar screen so that looking forward, you know, it's helpful that we get, we're getting the help and the assistance right now because we need it. Um, but, you know, part of it is not going to be recurring and the costs aren't going to go away. Right. right. You know, and some of the costs. Oh, I'm sorry, me. Madam Chair. Um, I was just going to mention some of the costs, you know, uh, especially for, say, public works, public safety, um, you know, those costs did increase in their budgets um, because of backfilling and, and things like that. Um, and then many of the expenditure purchases, not so much personnel costs for general government, but um, you know, buying of the air purifiers and the sprayers and things like that were unexpected, unforeseen expenses. So it was very helpful to receive, you know, reimbursement for those expenses as they were unbudgeted. Yep, um, yep. But as you mentioned, you know, the, the town administrators, part of his salary for his hours spent on it, the health directors um, hours spent on it, those items, uh, the excess, you know, spent on COVID are reimbursable. And like you said, there was no additional compensation for those hours. So, you know, that, did get moved off to the grant fund. And at the end of the fiscal year, we will see a surplus within those budgets that have spent time on COVID. But then on the flip side, you know, um, some not necessarily for like police and fire, you know, those will get, those are moved off, but there's not a necessarily, a, if we have to, the person is quarantined and we had a fill, you know, it's, we still pay for the person that was supposed to work and the person that was filled that shift, that's the person that gets, gets moved off to get reimbursed. Mm -hmm. So um, the excess cost would be, but there wouldn't be the, the same offset like you would see in the TA's budget, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. No, I, I just, I just think it's important to identify it and then say, okay, really, what is the, uh, what, what are we going to be carrying forward without any reimbursement going forward? Because, right, right. I mean, we're still going to have expenses, right? You know, uh, the cleaning expenses and things like that. That who knows when that is going to have to end, and the reimbursement 
as of right now, isn't there, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we do, we, we are keeping track um, the best that we can of all, every possible thing that we can think of that is COVID related. Yeah, that's great. Anyone else have any questions for the finance director? Okay, so we'll have you back soon. Well, you will see me for every meeting for from now until probably June, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all right, well, thank you. Yes, thank you all. Okay, so let's move on to our next order of business, which is the town administrator's report. I have no report. Oh, thank you. Okay, then no, any questions? Uh, next order of business. <laughs> <laughs> any questions or no report? <laughs> yeah, I like report. that we do an old and new business <laughs> right next to board member reports because we can kind of kill two birds with one stone. So go ahead, Mr. O'Leary, anything? Uh, nothing new on the board member reports. I'm all, right. all, I'm all set there, but, but I do have uh, something on a, on a new business that I think we should um, just be aware of and, and maybe invite uh, some people from Reading Municipal Light to come in and, and chat with us about. Uh, I don't know if anybody's aware of, uh, it's been brought to my attention, uh, that they've made some investments in, uh, in a biomass energy uh, fuel, future fuel plant that's being bu built out in Western Massachusetts. And, you know, we should be concerned as to, uh, there's a long-term agreement, like 20 years. Uh, I think we should be concerned and should be made aware as to um, the contracts they're entering into as to whether they're in everybody's best interest, let's put it that way. I mean, we, we have very good rates. Reading, Reading Municipal Light has done a good job of uh, maintaining low rates for us. And we're probably way below, like on the trash stuff, uh, uh, neighboring communities, as far as what we pay for our, our electric bills. But by the same token, you know, what are we doing and at, at what cost? Uh, it appears as though the executive director down there has entered into this agreement without necessarily uh, significant input and no awareness on the part of the um, Citizens Advisory Board and or uh, uh, the full Municipal Light Board. Uh, so I, I think if we could have them invite them in to, uh, to discuss you know, what they're doing as far as from an environmental standpoint, and clean energy, uh, is, you know, I, I think it's important. Additionally to that, you know, supposedly we're supposed to be buying into you know, clean energy deals, but they keep selling off the the RECs, the certificates. So actually we can't claim to be a clean energy community and we're a party to it. So I think if we could uh, invite um, our representative to the to the, uh, the team down there, plus um, the executive director just to come in. And again, I don't want to take away from what they're doing. They're doing some very good things, you know, obviously, you know, energy efficiency, promoting heat pumps, electric vehicles and things like that. So I want to applaud them for that. But some of these other long-term major contractual obligations, um, I think we need to be made aware of and weigh in as to whether or not we think it's appropriate. And, uh, you know, just put them on the agenda for half an hour in the not too distant future, because uh, apparently they signed the contract, but you know, one of the, when the plant is gonna be built, they may have an opportunity to get out of that deal too. But I think they need to be more transparent and make their people like Town of North Reading, who, major portion of their business aware as to where they're getting their energy from. So I'd request that uh, we put them on the agenda, invite them up to uh, have a discussion with us. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Do you think we can do that in the uh, too distant future? We shall see. We're getting we're we're putting light agendas and we're we're here till midnight. So I think if we're giving them a half an hour, it's going to have to be on an agenda that we're, we can, uh, you know, we have extra time somehow. Well, they also have though, uh, time is of the essence in relation to the contract that's been signed and whether they're doing things that are really in everybody's best interest. And while we may have low rates, you know, someone has said to me, you know, at what cost? And, and I think mm -hmm. we shouldn't ignore it. I think mm -hmm. we should be informed. And I think um, the public mm -hmm. has, has 
a right to know, and they have an obligation to be transparent about it. I'm so, surprised they didn't bring it to our attention themselves, because they usually do come in with new. No, they didn't bring it to our attention in the uh, executive director down there signed the contract without getting it approved through the normal course of action uh, mm. that, that would take place. So I think that, uh, you know, we have an obligation to hold them accountable and uh, and ask them to justify it. That's all. And then maybe there's a reasonable justific justification for it. Maybe there's an honest difference of opinion as, in relation to um, whether investing in biomass energy is a good idea or a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But it, we're talking about you know, long-term impact and you're talking about the contract that they signed is they're the single largest municipal light company to sign into this agreement where most municipal light companies decided to opt out and not get into it. So it's, um, you know. So maybe we reach out, we could have the TA reach out uh, for some more information from them, you know, regarding the transaction and and also, you know, how are they going to be claim, continue to claim to be, you know, clean energy when they continue to sell off the wrecks? Because uh, there's all sorts of uh, opinions now coming from the Attorney General's office and the federal government state, stating that basically you can't claim to be a clean energy um, producer if you sell off those wrecks. So it's, you know, I, I just think it's very important from a, uh, environmental standpoint, future standpoint, and in the direction that they're taking. Now, they're an elected independent board down in Reading. Um, they have a citizens advisory committee that they're not keeping well informed. And I think uh, the customers, the one who are using the energy should have a say in relation to what do we want to be paying for and what do we want them investing in and where do we want our energy to come from? And uh, timing is, of, is important. And uh, so I think if the town administrator could reach out, uh, ask for more information and ask them to come and give a brief presentation to the board as to what they've done and why they're doing it. I think it would be important and enlightening. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. So can we have the, can we, anything else? Can we have the administration do that? Well, we just said that. I wasn't sure. Okay. No, he, he was actually nodding his head. Oh, okay. I'm happy to do so, yes. Yeah. All right, that's great. Very good. Okay. Other than that, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Other than, other than uh, I think a lot of us are notified that the management company over at the uh, Stop and Shop Plaza are forcing cars stationary out of business after 58 years. I think it's an awful situation. Um, I think something needs to be said publicly that uh, you know, as we try and support our local businesses who have been struggling here, but we've got a long term. Um, small business that's just being driven out uh, by a management company, not even the owners, but a management company uh, who doesn't even reside here in the community. And I think, uh, I think it's a terrible disservice to uh, the cars. I think it's a disservice to the community because they've been good longstanding members. They live in the community and they've been longstanding 58 year member of the business community here. And I think it's tragic and unfortunate and it shouldn't be left unsaid that uh, I think it's a disgrace. So. Other than that, now I'm set. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Studo? Yes. Um, two brief things. One, out of the last ZBA, um, Pulte Homes went in front for the project it's to, to add the second story, the fifth story to the four buildings that they're building. And the hearing got continued. However, they did make a concession on... 10% affordable housing just to keep the stock level. Um, it's pretty much it. There was some public comment about it. It seemed that uh, most of the complaints, again, as I mentioned before, were for elevator parking. But I think that, again, from a zoning bylaw issues, I think it was made very clear that the hearings continue. There's going to be more uh, they're going to come back with some information for the ZBA, but in the essence of what the ZBA is ruling on, the parking and elevator really, that discussion is really not uh, coming into play, meaning they, it's a consideration, but it's not. So that's kind of the gist of it. Um, and again, I think it's been continued to March 11th, if I'm looking at the calendar correctly. And if I'm off that, my apologies. So, um, 
Bruce Wheeler, I don't have to give an update. Thanks. We talked about it for 40 minutes, so I can move on from that. And then the other thing that came up um, on the CPC was that Abacus presented um, just some of their per, you know, findings and what developers said. Uh, conversation is going to be continued. I can give you in a nutshell what it is. Um, as of right now, uh, in my opinion, um, from what I gathered and the report is available for anyone, there's a whole fo folder on it. I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done. It seems that the next step would be to talk to the property owners. Um, but more importantly, what I can report back to the board from what I heard is that, I mean, right now, it, it's just not a, um, uh, thank you. Maureen said that uh, ZBA meeting was, uh, to March 4th, not uh, the the 11th. I was going to correct you. She beat me to it. Th uh, thank you for that. So, um, so although, let's see here. Yes, uh, that's why my calendar was off. Thank you, Maureen. Um, so really, it's just a continuing conversation on the Winter Street and what Abacus said. Uh, you know, however, at this point, it just seems that until the discussions had with the property owners, there's really, there's really nothing else to really discuss. Um, you know, so that's kind of, um, you know, that's it. Unless somebody has any more questions, I can elaborate even more on either the Pulte or the Abacus. Okay. <laughs> I think that's good. I was actually, I did have the opportunity to sit in because I wanted to hear on those three and I was a little bit, I was actually more than surprised that as this study was funded with, um, the, the, the study was intended to be a meeting of those property owners to determine whether or not they wanted to buy in or tie in or, you know, have any involvement in wastewater treatment plant and very little of what I heard of that presentation the other night had anything to even do with property owners. So it was quite a surprise that they haven't even connected with the property owners at this point or a butters. It was a gentleman who appeared and said that he's heard nothing about it. And I also think it's really, that should have been the starting point. In my opinion, you have people that in the parcel that they've redesigned in their proposed redesign, they have people live there. There's a, there's a, a, a group of residents that live in that, in that, uh, there was no, nothing in the presentation about the costs associated with relocating those residences. Kids that attend school that live in that, that, uh, par parcel, the, um, the mobile home parcel. I mean, they, they, we have residents that live there that, 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 that I just don't even understand moving forward with the design when you haven't even tied in the people that own the land that we're even talking about. So I was a little, I was more than surprised about that. Um, and, and the fact, fact of, is there a potential taking that's going to need to take place eminent domain taking if these owners haven't even been talked with so i think there's a lot of things that are putting the cart before the horse in terms of that so it was a little bit of a surprise to me so there was very little about a treatment of water a wastewater treatment plant there so but that is just my opinion of it. But I'm glad that they did. They they were like us. They met for a long time and taught. They give a lot of thought to a lot of the things that they're reviewing. So that was a good meeting to, to sit in on. Um, so thank you uh, for uh, the updates, Mister Mister Walner. Yeah, I, I did attend the Abacus uh, CPC meeting as well. And I do think it's in the right order the way it was presented because the wastewater was one of the original advocates meetings from the very beginning. It was like very clear that, you know, for $3 million, you can put in a package treatment plant that would more than take care of all any potential development in that area. So that was like good news up front. And then the rest of the focus has been trying to create what the project might look like. 
because it's really hard. When EDC had their meeting with the business owners and landowners before, there was no plan to put in front of them. And so it was kind of at the end of the end of the EDC meeting, it was like, well, what would you like us to do? You know, tell us what you'd like us to do. And nobody really knows. So you really had to go through creating a plan so that you can show the landowners, the seven landowners, what this project will look like and if they have any interest in moving forward. And so we are at the right time to be talking to the seven landowners with something tangible to show them based on, you know, a good year's worth of work trying to put a plan together. So I think it's actually, this is the right time to be looking at this and getting them involved. Um, I, I don't- Can I add one thing to both really? of your, your thing? Cause, cause one thing and like, I, you know, I, I think this is a discussion for a different time, but let's call the plan what it is and anyone can go see it from the cells. It's a developer wish list where in reality, and anyone who says different is not reading what I read, where in reality, a developer, there was a conversation had with developers who came up with that Abacus said, these 10 things need to happen for this to work on its current form. That that was the presentation. So I'm not saying that it was a bad presentation, but I just, I don't want to create this false narrative that the town is ready to pony up and bend over backwards on 10 different points and spend money left and right just to make this happen. Because at the current form, that's the only way a business owner is going to get it done. And that's reality. And, and there's a bunch of stuff there. So I, you know, for a different conversation, I can bullet point go through everything Abacus did because I've been reading everything Abacus put together now for, for a month, almost weekly. So, I mean, if we're, you know, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have the plan, but let's call it what it is that it's a, what else can we give you, Mr. Developer? Can you please come to town? We beg you. That's really what that presentation was. So let's just not go overboard and say it was an awesome thing. I, I didn't say awesome. And I, and I think it has challenges, but I do think there is a lot of community interest in seeing this project go forward. We've seen that. that I agree that, with. I, I'd like something there too, but so we, we I, I mean, of, but I, it, it is in our, it's our duty to, and CPC has embraced this to bring forward this, this, this plan, this development, and to bring it to its end, no matter what the end might be. All I ever wanted from the very beginning was for this plan to have a seat at the table and have a chance to be exposed. It's getting exposed. It's good. There's challenges. There's no doubt. There's always going to be any kind of public-private project. There's going to be challenges. I don't think the challenges are insurmountable, um, but I do think the town also has to recognize that there is a lot of community will or has been expressed in the past to see something like this happen. And there might be some bending we have to do to make it happen. That's part of the deal. But there, there also could be substantial benefits to the town for years and years to come. And just the last note I'll say about that is what Warren said, the chair of the CPC has said, is if we don't push forward a plan and try to bring that forward, then we're gonna end up with piecemeal, we'll end up with a piecemeal project that will never have, it'll always be uh, you know, hodgepodge of, of, of development in that area because people will start doing their own things. We already know one person wants to do their own thing. So it's a chance for our, to us embrace, to plan for the future, to embrace the future, to get community involvement. And if at the end of the day, the town doesn't vote for it, then that's the and, way it is. And, and I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with that perspective. You've been in the meeting, but again, it's something where I think we need to define public and private partnership. The, the town right now is trying to facilitate. That's what my understanding that the CPC is trying to do. Yes. Asking the town, but when you say public private partnership, that to me says public money. And I feel that the notion that I think it is just, unless that's really what's on the table, I don't, I think we should be very clear that we, that the CPC has never once said that we're going to pony up money from our pocket because that, that's just not, that's just not where it is, unless I'm wrong. But I've been listening to the meetings like you, Rich. No, we're, and not, like, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But we're not, no, but, but, but hold on. It, it but that's wrong because if, if the, if the CPC is going to now go and put the property owners together, you, the, the, there's going to be a bigger discussion before the property owners have said, hey, the town might pony up their own wallet. That's, 
that's a big problem. So I just feel like public um, and private needs to I, be defined. I think that's a strategic dis uh, discussion that happens before you have an open meeting. Uh, okay, I think we uh, need to move on, but I, I do think it should, I mean, I think the bottom line is not one single portion of those parcels is publicly owned. So I don't even think you need to get further to define public private. The the redesign was of all a, a a group of parcels that we that we don't even own. So it doesn't didn't make a lot of lot of sense. Kind of the rerouting of the of the study, but but let's move on, Mr. Walner. You have other. Do you have anything else in terms of your reports? Just two other things. We can um, debate this for another hour, and I think yeah, <laughs> it's at, least, at least an hour. Yeah. A, <laughs> right. I, I'm not weighing in because I don't want to continue it for now. No, it's, it's, a substantial, <laughs> it's a substantial We're going to have to put this as an agenda item, apparently. But, no. you know, anyway, it's go ahead. Well, I'm sorry for interrupting you. No, it's okay. It's an agenda week. I mean, it's like a big, it's a big project, and there's a lot of factors that have to be thought about. Let's just end it right there. Um, uh, on the CARS note, uh, Steve Valeria, I will let you know I'm in direct contact with people who are in a grassroots level are contacting the landlord out in, I think it's Ohio or something like that. They're writing letters, they're calling them, and they're petitioning them to try to, you know, help out cars if they possibly can. Um, so there is a grassroots effort going on right now. Yep. Um, and if anybody wants to get involved, they can contact me. I can put you in contact with the people who are doing that. Um, and then I had last week, um, I met, we, I said the last meeting that the bike trail, the recreational trail, was hitting some hurdles. We did meet with the DOT uh, last week. Um, DOT has many, many different rules, guidelines to get their money to fund. They have a lot of rules and regs. Um, one of the big ones that is 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 a I, I don't want to call it a major um, impediment, but it is a consideration is that uh, DOT will only fund if you make your your bike trail, your recreational trail, uh, uh, have value within your own town uh, borders. And so, and the way they define that is that each terminus at each end of the bike trail, it has to be paved and accessible to some public area. So it's easy if we terminated at Fitzwood River, if we terminated at 28, that's an acceptable terminus. But the whole goal was to have it go east to connect to that trail and going through Linfield and Middleton. And that's the whole point, because if you get out there, then you're exposed to a whole wide variety of different trails all the way to the ocean. Um, but by definition, by the DOT, you have to end it at a place where it ends in a, like an intersection, a paved area. And so this has become a really complicated issue because of that one particular um, aspect. So the consultant and Phil Hertz are working together again to look at what can we do. There's some town property that we might be able to access. It's uh it's um gonna take a little bit of a rework on what we're doing. So it's a it's a setback, but not the end of the game. Um and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez, anything? Um just an update on the Putnam House property committee met Last week, um, they are making progress. They um, they voted in officers and discussed their agenda going forward. They're hoping to have a meeting um, with with Mr. Gilberto and maybe town council. They have some questions that they're not sure of um, that they grant questions and things like that. Um, so hopefully we can get a, maybe a meeting together. And Mr. O'Leary, I don't know if you have so much knowledge. There's times when they're asking me questions and I'm like- Yeah, I'm sorry I wasn't able to participate. No, I know, I know it's hard. You can't do everything, but I just, I, I feel like there were questions they were asking me that maybe you could have answered. Uh, okay. um, just because, you know, you just know so much about all of that stuff, so. Yeah. Um, but their next meeting is March 16th. It's a Tuesday night. And I know for the TA, I know that that's a tough night. Um, and I don't know about you, Mr. O'Leary, but 
um, I told them that I would try to get them connected to get their questions answered. So if, maybe if we can put another night together, a meeting, um, if that's possible. Yeah, to piggyback on Leanne, Steve, do me a favor, never miss one of the, don't leave me hanging on the wastewater talks because like you help clarify a lot for me. And if I got to give like the update, people are going to think source canceled. Like, <laughs> you know, so like, yeah, make sure that like, yeah, you're. <laughs> All right. Maybe do, can you try to work on that? Maybe you can work on that offline. Yeah. On scheduling that offline when people know a better, a better handle on that. There was just one other thing, Madam Chair, There's just in relation to uh, the Putnam House, but also the Historical Antiquarium Society has a, a subcommittee uh, looking into the Boston Post Cane, uh, giving out to the oldest resident. Uh, it's coming along nicely where they were actually going to be purchasing a cane, you know, and they're looking at putting together a uh, display case for the cane and uh, some methodology as to how the award and when the awards are going to be made, things like that, just reinstituting something that was here years ago, and it's a it's a great idea. And looking for a little bit of space in the in the library to display the the, the cane, but there'll be a whole proposal coming forward through the to the administration uh, to address it. But it's uh, pretty exciting. It's good. They're excited about doing it, and um, they've secured some funds to purchase the canes and make some plaques and some other things. So it's uh, another ongoing effort, which is admirable and again adds to the flavor of the community and recognizes long term residents. Uh, We've lived here more than 25 years, so it's, it's, it's great. So it's ongoing. Is there an original cane somewhere around here? It got lifted uh, a few years back. So, oh. <laughs> oh, no. so uh, nobody knows it's where not it is. in your basement, is it? <laughs> no, it's not in my basement. Remember, you know, someone was asking me, listen, anything that's left over from your mother's stuff? I said, no, there's nothing there. Uh, but no, it, 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 oh, we, really? we know who the we know who the last holder of the cane was, and she ended up uh, in, in a nursing facility, and it was on display. It was in her room there, and it disappeared, oh. unfortunately. So it's been missing for a number of years. Oh. But uh, but they're working hard and diligently on it. They come. They have a place that's going to uh, make the cane up, and it, it'll be nice. So it'll that's be good. Great. And they're looking forward to at some point, you know, just. Highlighting it and what they're looking to do here before the board at some point once they're ready to go. So this glorious pet project, right? Do it a glorious pet projects. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, and then um, just old and new business. I just wanted to mention. Um, I was going to mention the Hallmark store, and um, I think we all feel the same way about that. And it's nice to hear, um, Rich, that there's there's a group doing that that's fantastic and hopefully they can make some progress yeah. um and i also wanted to mention Descolis is going out of business oh, um nice. and dave benoit just he did so much he he was right there always um fundraising for the food pantry and you know w all kinds of different things so you know that that's a real loss and hate to see that go also and that's it Okay, thank you. I was going to mention that too, but say, seeing as how everybody else did, I won't say the same as everyone else, but we, I did get contact and I think the TA got contacted too on that. Just ask the board to kind of maybe talk about it. I know there's not really much we can do, but again, like Leanne, like Mrs. Gonzalez said, I think it's good to hear Mr. Walner that there's at least an effort to try to do something on their behalf, you know? Yeah. We have such, so so few businesses here in the community as it is you hate to see you know you hate to see them close like that well, well maybe you know the board could just take a position that endorsing whatever and again i don't know what the, the grassroots efforts is going to entail but uh, endorsing their efforts to uh, encourage the management company to uh, retain the hallmark store you know in the plaza but uh, it's, a, it's a token gesture on our part but uh, small gesture on our part for, for the 58 years of right. the business that was here. I mean, and, uh, is there you know, anything, right, anything wrong with us weighing in publicly, just saying, you know, this is a bad idea, poor public relation wise, and um, yeah. these people need to be supported. Was it, a, was, it a, was it an issue of Mr. Walner, maybe you know, was it a issue of 
did they just want something else in there or Hallmark just couldn't pay maybe 2020 rents? Well, the rent went way up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The rent got, they got slammed with the rent. Um, okay. Which is usually have, just a ploy to get them out. Right. And they've already, and they've already got someone else signed up to go in, you know? So, but the funny thing is if you go to the landlord's <laughs> website, they talk about community values, family values, all that other stuff. So, you know, um, it's, Don't they have an open space? I could have sworn there's a for lease sign right next to it, right? It's they, been there for a while, right? Uh, I think so. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, yeah. But they're pushing somebody else out there. I forget who else, who else it is. But um, anyways, um, you know, the landlord at his own because he apparently owns other properties. He claims, you know, family and community values, but here we are, you know, knocking out a piece of our community. So that's what the thrust of the letter came from. And I think Rita Mullen was one of the Key, uh, key authors of that letter. And I know Joyce, my Joyce worked on it with her and you know they put the number out there so people would call. So there's been a lot of people calling, getting involved. I don't know what can happen, but you know, at least we're trying. Well, if we all collectively agree that maybe we can, it, it doesn't really have any legal weight, certainly, but it, it could send a message. I think that's a good idea. If I'm in favor of signing my name to any letter. You well, know. you know what? Let me get the um, let me get the letter from Rita Mullen, and uh, mm. and we can look at that and use that as a as a framework to work off. But I know we got sixty days. I, I I know we have that. So I tell Mr. Gilberto, this is a little bit different, and it is midnight. But if 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 Rich can, if Mr. Walnut can get that letter to you, and then you can send it to each of us, I think we'd we probably all would be willing to sign off on something like that, that just kind of expresses our position that, you know, el eliminating a good, you know, tenant and a good business isn't something that we're, you know, we can get behind. We'd rather have them rethink their decision on the matter or something to that effect. If I don't know what the letter says, Mr. Walner, but. Well, we could send off as a separate letter on our own, you know, use that as a piggyback off of that, but also, you know, it, it, as, as a board, and as board members, yes, I know to something like the chair just mentioned. So I think uh, it's excuse me. It'd be a starting point, right? Yep. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Excuse me. Rich, Rich, okay. if you can send me the draft that, that that you have going around. That would be great. I will. All right. Do I have a motion to a? I have a motion. <laughs> Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Can we change oh, Mike. Oh, Mike, I have a motion, Mike. Oh, wait one second. Mr. Gilberto, it's 12.03. <laughs> Just a friendly reminder that we do have a Saturday budget hearing upcoming this Saturday, February 27th. Um, we are looking to start at 8 o'clock promptly. Um, we have spoken with departments and asked them to streamline their presentations because there isn't a ton that's new and we are going to be in a virtual forum. Um, we'll be right back at it with the Monday evening budget hearing on a week from ten a week from yesterday, <laughs> March first. Um, again, I know the agenda was lengthy tonight, but we're trying to really avoid compounding multiple department budget presentations with multiple other agenda items. So, hopefully, the time invested this evening will result in a shorter meeting next Monday night. Um, so, I just want to call that to your attention and remind folks. And um, if you haven't looked yet, the FY22 operating budget is in the share file folder for FY22. It's been there for about a week or so. Thank you, oh, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So who's delivering breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a plan for delivery, unfortunately. Uh. <laughs> we could do it and meet the COVID expectations. I mean, I could deliver Twinkies if you'd like, but <laughs> individually wrapped cupcakes or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so do I have a motion? Yes, motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Okay. And Manu Pelli is aye. Thank you all for your time. Can I post? Bye.